The Riverside Revolution is a dream come true for supporters of Middlesbrough Football Club. In six short months, Borough have become the talk of soccer, both on and off the pitch. It's been a remarkable story of four steps to heaven for a club facing bankruptcy only nine years ago. Even 18 months if you look back, we've got 6,000, 7,000 to Pearson Park and uh, we're struggling. But the way it's turned around, it's, it's, it's nothing short of a dream to show really. you. First came promotion to the Premiership at the first attempt for new Messiah Brian Robson. Victory over Luton in the final match at Ayrson Park secured the First Division Championship in Robbo's first season in charge. to their promised land and a brand new stadium to boot. This was the club's vision of the future, the master plan set in motion by Borough Chairman Steve Gibson. Just nine months after work began, the dream became reality, a superb all-seater stadium fit for the 21st century. Proof, if proof was needed, the Borough were aiming big. But that, of course, was only the start. Much more was to follow. Next came the first of two sensational successes on the transfer market for Brian Robson. A record five and a quarter million pound bid won the battle to sign England star Nick Barbie from Spurs. A great boost that set Burr up for a superb start to the season. excited about to come into the club. Uh, obviously working with Brian Robson and the, the club is very ambitious and you know there was only one club for myself and obviously I've I've played with Jamie at England youth level and uh, you know I saw all the players last year on the telly with a promotion uh, raised you know uh, obviously they were successful in that and you know hopefully we can do well this year in the Premier League. To me you know, you, you've got maybe six outstanding young English players coming through at the moment who've got really top potential. And uh, I'd class Nick as one of those players, and so we're delighted to bring a player of that calibre into our club. If the fans were not yet convinced that Borough really did mean business, there were no doubters after Borough's next success. The transfer coup of the season. Gigino, the Brazilian superstar hailed as the new Pele, was now the pride of Middlesbrough. Well, him, he was given a welcome fit for a king. It was a long way from the Maracana, but the warmth of the Teesside reception was quite spectacular. More about Gigino, including a look at the few of his Brazilian goals, later in the programme. <laughs> Meanwhile, we take you back to the start of August and the pre-season photo call at Ayrson Park. Do a few. Thanks, Nidal. Well, Jan, must be one of the most exciting uh, pre-seasons for you. Yeah, it's been a special summer for me because I've played uh, national games almost all summer. 
but I, I do look forward to start the season now. I mean, after one year in Division 1, I hope I don't ever have to go back there. And um, I'm very looking forward to the game. You don't feel too tired or anything because you were spent all last summer playing World Cup football and then this summer playing international football? No, as long as I did well. The, the games we played and uh, scored goals. And um, then it's not that hard on you. But, but you need a time now. I need a time with the team. and uh, to. Uh, I, just, I was here for eight weeks and it's, it's kind of a learning process still. So I'm just looking forward to the trainings now and whatever you have to do before the first start against uh, Arsenal. Well, John, uh, most exciting season to look forward to. That's right. I mean, uh, hopefully we can build on where we left last year and, and go on and, and do well this year. Do you feel that you've got the ammunition to deal with the Premiership? Uh, we're more equipped than we were last time we got up there, in all fairness. And plus we've got a few well behind us. And uh, I think that is a telling factor nowadays. I mean, uh, more and more and more, I mean, you have to be spending... Let's see, it's all about money. Twelve months ago we were talking here, you were looking forward to your very first uh, season as a manager. Uh, how would you reflect back on that? Yeah, I mean, things have went well for us. Um, you know, the priority was achieved where we got promotion into the uh, Premier League. Uh, but the real hard work starts now, um, you know, and we've got to make sure that we establish ourselves this season. Uh, and the lads are going to have to work hard to do that. In retrospect, uh, looking back at what you did, is there anything you would change or you'll, you'll change this season in, in the way you manage? No, not really. Um, you know, the, the way I, I took control last year, um, I'll stick to the principles, uh, what I did last year, and um, carry them forward into this year. Now then, there's talk in the papers about uh, Nick Barmby coming here. What, what is the situation? Yes, well, I tried to buy Nick last year. Um, he's a quality player, and... Tottenham now have made him available. Um, so at this moment of time, it's just a matter of trying to agree a, a price uh, for him, but we are interested in the lad. Three days later, Robson finally got his man. Nick Barmby, the dynamic midfielder, chosen to build a team around. A prize catch and a clear indication that Borough were not in the Premiership to make the numbers up. It's been an on-off saga. What finally tipped the balance? Well, I mean, that had nothing to do with... Uh, it was just the two clubs, really. I mean, you know, it's like with, with the transfers, they never really run smooth, like... And uh, the, I was just desperate, you know, to, to come to the club because I wanted to work under Brian Robson and, and the chairman's very ambitious. Not just that, he's a, he's a die-head Middlesbrough supporter and that's great for the club and obviously the, the new stadium is lovely and all the fans, you know, everyone loves the football up here and, and you know, I feel as though I can enjoy my football here. 96 hours later, the media were back on Teesside. This time to welcome Man United goalkeeper Gary Walsh. A deputy at Old Trafford, but soon to become the number one choice for Borough. How do you, how do you want to play it? Um, Pot formed me up about three weeks ago. Said he was interested in signing me. And I was out of contract at United. Um, they offered me a three-year contract, but I felt like I wasn't going anywhere at United. So uh, Pop's offered me a three-year contract here. Were you pleased to be joining Middlesbrough? Yeah, especially Poppy. Yeah, you know I think the club's going in the right direction with the management and the staff they've got here, and um, I just feel like Middlesbrough are the club that I want to go to at the moment. Meanwhile, Borough kicked off their Premiership season at Highbury. The spotlight was on the £10 million combination of Dennis Bergkamp and England skipper David Platt, but Borough debutant Barmby stole the headlines. Anxious early moments for the club from the northeast at the moment. You do feel if Arsenal could strike early here, it might set up the season. But having said that, I think it was Kevin Campbell scored two minutes into last season against Manchester City. A big win, 3-0 in their opening game, and then a real tilt downwards in results straight after that. The other side of that today, of course, man, is if they don't get a goal in the opening 20 minutes, then it could be a real test of the patience they look very well organised, Robbo's side. And they don't look as if they're going to push out recklessly and leave space behind them. They're dropping off and defending in good areas. That's Hignett's pass for Barmby. It's unlucky, the flag is up. But the three... We talked about the three at the back. Here we've got the three at the front. Fjortoft guiding it down for Hignett, who's brought into play, facing the play. That's very tight. They get it just about right. I think the was spot on, but it's a little warning for Arsenal that if they're not 
100% at it at the back. There are players in Fjordov, Hignett and Barmley that can punish them. Both clubs unbeaten in their pre-season games. I mentioned at the start Craig Hignett, who's had a terrific time really insisting on a place in the starting 11 with uh, nine pre-season goals. John Hendry, incidentally, is injured. Right. We found Hignett. They used to call uh, Craig Hignett, of course, the new David Platt, because he came from crew, as Platt did. Well, we've got... Rioc and Robson, two VRs, hoping that their teams are along the right lines. Managers, of course, who were in opposition last season in Division One. First time. Musto. Built up with a flick. And Nick Barbie has given Middlesbrough a fantastic start at Highbury on his Middlesbrough debut. Brian Robson and company back amongst the big boys. They played here with great poise for the opening half an hour. And they've taken the lead. Wonderful ball. They've been threatening. This partnership of Fjortoft and Bambi has threatened on more than one occasion in this opening half hour. And they get it absolutely right. Look at the flick. It's absolutely perfect. The run is beautiful. And a young head, what composure. Could easily have panicked Nicky Bambi. He kept his head beautifully and slotted it past a very good goalkeeper quite comfortably. Well, there it is. Arsenal nil, Middlesbrough one. Did you see the shot of the manager, Robbo? Was he celebrating the goal? No. No, way. no way. He knew, he knew he had to get to his back line. 
It was on to Vickers and Pearson and Derek White. Ten minutes, you saw him, ten minutes, composure. And I think he's worried about the young kids, and rightly. Now he's saying, experienced lads, you get around them. Settle for ten, don't give anything away. But we're there right. A run the lead. Oh, well, that's the other side of the end right, a little bit of a petulant reaction. As he turns somewhat on Steve Vickers. But a 1-0 lead. It's still a relatively fragile situation in Middlesbrough's favour at this stage. And one wonders how they would react if Arsenal can bounce back quickly. And right! We'll learn more of Middlesbrough now, and certainly of the new shape to Arsenal, but it's a player very much of the George Graham era who has brought them level here. In right again. Yeah, it was a lovely goal, but Middlesbrough were disappointed with the build-up. I think you should be clearing this, there's no real danger there. But when Palace slots a beautiful pass in, that's a great header from right. Off the pitch, Borough had cut it fine in their race to add the finishing touches to the Selnet Riverside Stadium. Construction men had worked round the clock to meet the deadline for the season's opening home match. The doubters were put in their place when Steve Gibson was given the green light for Borough to stage their first ever match at the Riverside on schedule. Borough's biggest crowd for 13 years greeted Glenn Hoddle's Chelsea complete with summer signings Rude Hullett and Mark Hughes. It turned out to be a perfect day. It was a very uh, formidable uh, attack the Blues have got with uh, Mark Hughes leading the uh, front line, but they haven't scored in two games so far this season. Home to Everton and away to Nottingham Forest. And Middlesbrough intend to uh, try and keep that record going here this afternoon. By Sinclair. That's the touch. I come off. Middlesbrough, who got off to such a wonderful start at Highbury last Sunday. It's a beautiful football. The first foul of the match there, conceded by Chelsea. And Miller quickly takes the free kick. And it's over the line. Ken Clark stumbling. Barmby. Fiatoff, oh, beautiful ball to Barmby. He's through on goal, squares it, 1-0! Craig Hignett, the scorer. And the stadium erupts. Hignett gets the praise. But what a beautifully weighted ball by Jan Fiatoft. Here's the build-up again. Just look at this. First time layoff by Fiatoft. Barmby racing through. I think Craig Hignett had given... Uh, he's running in support out of the picture now. But I think he'd given up. He thought Barmby was going to go all the way. Here comes the cross. A right-footed shot into the top right-hand corner. Karine, no chance at all. It's Middlesbrough 1. Chelsea, nil. The joy, the joy of scoring. And a real buzz here now. The first goal that Chelsea have conceded this season. And it was a real cracker. The build-up absolutely beautiful. Steen. Let's it through for Spencer. Good tight work from him. Middlesbrough, get it away, now, three against two. Hignett on the charge, Fiatoff to the left. Plays it to the right to Barmy. Fiatoff wants it on his head, 2-0! Oh, what a finish! Another perfect goal, and there's that windmill flight plan of his. Celebrating his first goal of the season. Clinical, precise, a magic finish. And the 28,286 here today 
Well, here's their response. Ball played, allowed. Here's Barmby. Fiatov now is calling for the ball in the centre. He looks up, chips it in, and a perfect first-time shot, wrong-footing the goalkeeper. And uh, Sinclair. It's Middlesbrough 2, Chelsea 0. The most important thing today is to get that first uh, victory at home or victory in the league under your belt. You, we are all confident now. We, it's a fantastic atmosphere today and we, we produced uh, and uh, I think we're all happy about that. Well, the first goal of course came from that uh, first time layoff by you. Similar uh, ball to the one you played at Highbury in fact. I mean, I think I've developed a bit in that part of the game. I'm, I'm more can, can deliver as well. I can and can put people in, and, and that's role is quite important in this team. The way we're playing at the moment, with me as a lonely striker <laughs> from the start, but you know, I mean, Higgins and and Barmy coming from behind, it, it's quite good. I think for me as well, it's just to get a first goal. It's always important for a striker to get a first goal on your belt. You've got something to build of. And, uh, uh, you tend to, to forget, but I've been through times when that goal didn't come, and uh, I know you got a first one in your belt that couldn't be more happy. Well, Craig, your 60th league goal is one that will forever be in history. Yeah, it will. Yeah, to score it at a stadium like this with the day it was was just a dream for me. Tell us about it, because it was a real corker, wasn't it? I had too much time to think about it. I mean, if you ask strikers, they'll say, oh, you know, the best things are instinctive. But Nick made a great run and great vision from him. He squared it and it seemed an age before it got to me. So I just hit it in the end and luckily for me, it went in. While Borough had made a dream return to the Premiership, it was Newcastle who were setting the pace with six points out of six. A St James's Park showdown with Kevin Keegan's men gave Borough a real test of how much progress had been made. On the night, fortune was against the Borough a single goal on 67 minutes was the only difference between the sides. A brilliant cross by David Ginola, headed home by Les Ferdinand. <laughs> Borough were left to rue a penalty that got away in the dying seconds. Newcastle were lucky to escape when Jamie Pollock's claims for a spot kick were turned down. Four points from the opening three matches meant Borough finished August in 11th position. Meanwhile, England's Wembley date with Columbia meant a 10-day break before Borough were back in action against Bolton. Gary Walsh made his debut in place of injured Alan Miller at Burnden Park. Almost setting Pollock away, it does now. The covering tackle, interception by Phillips. Nobody able to quite get a grip on the game. Again, Barnby away. Is that a penalty? The referee was a good 25 yards away. And didn't have a clear view. And doesn't give a penalty. You can see the referee right in the centre of the field. It was certainly an untidy challenge from Phillips, but not one worthy of a spot kick, according to Mr Allenson. Barnby, Ignis and Fjortoft with him. Barnby looking for Fjortoft, but tagging intercepts again. Now McGinley, this is what he likes to run at defenders, he's trying to chip, oh, a wonderful goal from John McGinley. McGinley makes his mark in the Premiership. And he rises to the elevated status. When he received the ball, there looked to be little danger, but that was improvisation, spotting the goalkeeper off his line, and a beautiful finish. Turns his man well. If he can get around Vickers, 
will beat everybody else for pace. He ponders too long, he's still going though. Vickers holds his ground well. McGinley. Schnakers, this is his shooting range. He puts some power behind that one. Unconventional from Walsh. The Freitas offside, but a good save anyway by Gary Walsh. And what a strong shot from Richard Schnakers. He scored four goals last season, three of them from exactly that distance. Loves to hit them from 25, 30 yards. That had so much power. Pignett looking for the head of Fjortoft, finding his chest. Down to Barmby, and another excellent save by Brannigan. The flag stays down. Onside Pollock, he's got to go alone, he does, Brannigan saves for it seems the umpteenth time. And this man's form has been of the highest standard. Barmby. Fjortov shields well again, turns nicely but finds Bergson just behind him. Thompson. They call him the trade a forwards challenge. Taken quickly. Barmby. Great pass. And this time Brannigan is beaten. And Craig Hignett gets the goal. It's Hignett who takes the fans' adulation. But again, it was brilliant approach play, and look at that for a pass by Nicky Barmby. And a wonderful finish as well by Hignett. And the players they call the twins, Barmby and Hignett, combined to bring Middlesbrough back into the game. Gary Walsh was again wearing the keeper's jersey against Saints, and he made a good start to his home debut. Available in the middle. And here's Letitia, the target. Lovely control and a good first time touch as well. And Walsh had to pull out the save. And again, it's hacked clear. And still Borough are rocking and rolling. It was Letitia who created that first opening. And still they've not got it clear. And finally prodded away. Real pressure there for Borough. And they've got the chance to springboard. Letitia causing the damage at one end. But Borough surviving and looking to threaten at the other. Fjortoft working hard to keep this move alive and succeeding. Oh, that was a real scare there. And Fjortoft trying to return the pressure. But that man, Letizia, again showing just how much danger he can create. run still going again a red shirt couldn't quite get on the end of it Pollock did well to keep that one moving out wide Fjortoft Hignett offering support back deep for Pollock and back to Vickers now but still it was to retain the possession Vickers trying one and worth it as well that one would have brought the house down Steve Vickers used to going forward in aerial combat, but this time showing what he can do on the deck. The opening was there, that was some distance, way, way beyond the penalty area, and flying not that far over the top of Besson's crossbar. Didn't reach Fjortov, Musto doing well to win it in midfield. And Vickers throwing himself at it. Barmby going over to support Fjortoft, who's in possession now. Well, the cross was far better than anyone might have expected. And it's Morris forward. Hignett. Fjortoft. Oh, he got a ricochet right there in the middle. And I wonder how much they knew about that at the heart of the Southampton defence. Letizia strolling out of it, and Musto battling. 
That was as close as Farah had come. Pignett, good work, holding up, waiting for the moment to deliver. Fjortov had peeled off there and it was bouncing around and definitely Fortune smiling on Southampton there. 15 minutes left, still Middlesbrough nil, Southampton nil. Borough pressing, but Southampton resisting. Fox and Hignett now. there to protest his case the referee running away wants none of it the consolation prize for Middlesbrough is a corner let's have a look at it again Fox on his run and there was a touch then and we're back with Pollock now a case if not a concrete one It was a frustrating night, I think, for many of the Middlesbrough fans. Brian, how frustrating was it for you, sat there on the bench? Yes, well, it is. Uh, but, I mean, sometimes you see the media and they always write it up that teams like Southampton and that are uh, three easy points. Um, but no matter who you play in the Premier League, uh, they can give you a hard game. You can just ask Newcastle that on Saturday. Um, so Southampton came here and they worked very hard against us. Um, and Gary Walsh had to do well for us on a couple of occasions in the first half. But at least I was pleased with the response in the second half. We started to get a grip of the game uh, a bit better and we had a few chances ourselves. And so at least the lads uh, give the fans something to shout about in the second half. And I suppose, although maybe the, the fans might be a little disappointed with a nil-nil draw, from a goalkeeper's point of view, a clean sheet is the first priority. Yeah, the, the back five have been you know, great. Like I did a couple of good saves, but that was it. You know, the back five, have, they're not let many goals in this year. Yes, it's a very solid system that's the, the foundation, really, for the way that Middlesbrough play. But it was very difficult and almost a taste of your own medicine at the other end because Southampton, too, were desperately hard to break down. Yeah, second half. I think um, halfway through the second half, I think they, they thought, oh, 0-0 would be a good result here. For the staff, they, 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 for the play to Southampton, they came towards line. But second half, I think they just settled for 0-0. So Borough frustrated and for the third match in a row denied a crucial penalty. Gary Walsh kept his place in goal at home to Coventry and Borough found Ron Atkinson's side another tough nut to crack. Long one again from Vickers, that's beautifully weighted. Now then, Piotr's the only one in the box, Barnby's joining him now. The cross doesn't come over. And uh, Chris Morris losing out. The throw is Coventry's. comes to Hignett. And Solarco blocking out Neil Cox, but Cox back on the ball again. Claims for handball, a shot by Barnby into the side netting. And that a close encounter as far as Coventry City are concerned. Oh, that's a blatant body check. Off the ball, and how the referee, well, he was there, he saw it all happen. Fair enough, uh, Jamie Pollock was nowhere near the ball, but that was a blatant body check by the Brazilian. Well, that could stir up uh, Middlesbrough uh, passion now and uh, put Coventry under a little bit of pressure. A nudge in the back there by Burrows and a free kick just uh, eight yards outside the penalty area nice little angle this too to work something Neil Cox making his way to the edge of the box on this side of the field Nigel Pearson well he's going over to where the ball is he's uh, standing in the wall Fiatoff in line behind him but uh, Fiatoff Musto and Cox the only three in the box at the moment way over the top Chris Morris getting caught there Richardson Smith and 
getting the cross in, and 1-0 it is, turned in by Williams. And then Isaias found the final touch, and the Brazilian celebrates. Oh, this was a, a tragedy for Burra right at the start of the second half. Pollock charging through. If ever there was a trier, it's this man. Hignett. Oh, off the crossbar! How unlucky can you get? Neil Cox measured that one. Vickers pumping it forward. Fiatov flicked it on. Barbie's in there. Oh, it's 1 1! No! The ball didn't carry. It looked a certainty there as Nick Barmby, he's so quick in those situations. Beautiful uh, touch on by Fiatov. The initial ball coming from Vickers. Here it is, Fiatov slick. Barmby gets his boot to the ball, he's beaten the keeper. You'd have thought that was going in. Bad luck to Burra. That's got the fans going anyway. Overcomes Hignett's cross. Cox seemed to lose it in the sun there. This time we've seen the sun here this afternoon. Jumped by Musto, doesn't uh, pay dividends. Oh, that's not a bad ball. Here's Neil Cox. Barmby can't reach it. Cleared by Richardson. Middlesbrough coming back with some purpose now. Barmby again. Vickers at the far post. Vickers with the header! Steve Vickers makes it 1-1. He's coming up 28 now. He's enjoying life in the top sphere of football. And here it comes, Barmby gets the crossover, beautifully weighted to the far post. Phelan's beaten. Vickers steers it in with his head. It's Middlesbrough 1, Coventry City 1. maybe to get the shot in here and I think it was too far out here's the one two again great little turn by Barmby back it comes chance here to um, Fiatov with the left foot how about that Jan Agi Fiatov his 32nd goal in league football in this is 86th appearance Great work here by Barmby. Tremendous turn there and the recovery of his balance and Fiatov hammers it into the top left-hand corner. So Middlesbrough have come from behind. It's Middlesbrough 2, Coventry City 1. I just thought we were just a bit sloppy and I didn't think we made the game as fierce as we would like it. I thought they had plenty of time to do what they want, so we pushed up a little bit higher and uh, made it difficult for them. And then, of course, when uh, they went ahead, uh... You had to come forward even more. That shows a bit of character in the players. I know going going a goal down at home, people tend to hide, but our players stuck at the task and they all shone for the ball. In the end, I thought we could have won by more, so it's a credit to them. The lads worked it superb on the right-hand side and Nicky's crossed it to the far post and I've just stayed in the box and um, it was on a place for me I couldn't miss. Because it must have seemed at one stage as if it was going to be one of those days you'd already hit the uh, crossbar and uh, no result. That's right, yeah, we've been unlucky the past few games, you know, with a few uh, shouts of penalties and things like that. So it was important, like I said, that we, that we won today. In the Coca-Cola Cup, Borough began with a second round tie against Rotherham. The men from Mill Moor were struggling in the bottom eight of the second division. But they raised their game at the Riverside. Brian Robson has resisted the temptation to make too many changes for a switch from Premier League to second division opposition. But he does give a debut in defence to former Ipswich centre-back Phil Whelan and a recall for Bolivian World Cup star Jaime Moreno in attack. Jan Argafjortoft scored an incredible nine goals in this competition for Swindon last season and he won over a few doubters with a brilliant goal against Coventry here four days ago. 
The League Cup holds fond memories for Rotherham. Amazing though it may seem, they reached the first ever final, losing only 3-2 on aggregate to Aston Villa. This is Rotherham United circa 1995 and includes big money summer signings, Paul Blades and Mike Jeffrey. Sean Gota holds the honour of being Rotherham's most capped ever player, courtesy of 18 international appearances for Bermuda. He scored the winner the last time Rotherham claimed a major scalp. That was Everton. Forward is Vickers now. The pitch looks nice. I'm talking to John Hendry, the uh, Middlesbrough striker, who's injured at the moment. Playing his first game for the reserves tomorrow. He says the players are enjoying playing on this surface. It's a good one. Sometimes new stadiums take a bit of getting used to. And he reckons the Middlesbrough players already like it. wide right for Cox, which he'll try and utilise now. Slips inside Roscoe's challenge, and it's found its way through from Moreno. Good turn in the area, and pure tough shot. And a feeble one in the end. Easily saved by Matt Clark. Fjortov did well to find some space in there, however, when the ball got through to him from Moreno. Turned his marker wild or well, but there's no strength in the shot. Really. Steve Vickers, which a local boy from the Spennymoor area. Fjordoft, good control from him. Rayner will know there's a man outside him, this is Cox. Good skill from uh, Moreno in particular. Cox has got the chance to play a killer ball in here now. And that is the lead for Middlesbrough. Robbie Musco's head. Beautifully created goal. And patience paid off for Middlesbrough. Rotherham had come so well up to that stage that Moreno figured in the move twice. But it was the killer ball from Neil Cox which opened the way for a simple header from Robbie Musto and Middlesbrough have a precious lead. Moreno had figured twice. The ball through to Cox was perfectly placed. The cross was inch perfect too. So was the header. And was stabbed away and it's found Jeffrey. And the white shirts try to get forward quickly and in numbers. Finally, it's found its way up to Roscoe. Just to slip Goodwin in. Roscoe. Again, they may be taking too long. Goethe's header. The first real effort for Rotherham. And Sean Goethe, inside the six yard area, directs the header downwards, but well stopped by Gary Walsh. Eventually, the throw arrives at the foot of Fjordoft. And he might get something inside the area. Fjord's off to full stretch, directs the shot straight at Matt Clark. Otherwise, it would have been 2-0. Well, so Norwegian rather angry with himself there. The chance came to him via Barby. He turned blades, no trouble at all, but he was at full stretch. Middlesbrough's corner, they lead by 1-0. And Cox comes in for it. Fjortoft, and uh, Moreno just couldn't get a kick in there. Another corner, but that's the closest Middlesbrough have come to a second goal, partly because of the bustling nature of Neil Cox. He gets in highest. Fjortoft was just looking uh, to hook it in, and he's headed away by Wilder. And another corner, and that's a better one. Fjortoft, I think, gets the final touch. He tells the crowd he did with his, his own uh, particular salute. He and Barbie may be disputing it between them. Well, let's have another look at this one. The important factor is that Middlesbrough lead 2-0. Rotherham have a real job on their hands now. There was the first header. Yes, it was Fjortoft. Well, have to do some defending this time, however. Jeffrey. That's Roscoe ahead of him. So he didn't have enough weight on the pass, and it's enabled Cox to come back. 
He beats away the hapless Roscoe and launches Middlesbrough again. With Moreno. Pollock, who somehow managed to extricate himself from all those tackles. But uh, it's with Rotherham now, the possession, and it's Gota. And he's in here, Gota. And a good finish from Sean Gota. And out of the blue, Rotherham will have a goal back. Give an inkling that there's a goal on, and Sean Gota will take it. The ball was threaded through to him, he took on Vickers, his pace carried him on the outside, the low shot went beneath Gary Walsh, and Rotherham have a toehold into the match again. It's all had come about as a nice little ball lap from Goodwin, but Pollock had gone down under a tackle, but as we thought they'd got a free kick, instead of which they concede a goal. This time Gota just concede possession, presenting it to Moreno. And Moreno involved, sure he'd love a goal tonight. Pollock might get one here, and now must go into some space. Morris. Pollock, great shot, and that was worthy of a goal. Lovely curling try from Jamie Pollock. Manoeuvred the space for himself. Did well here, Pollock. Showed the ball to Wilder, took it away from him, dragged it just over. Well, it won't really look like conceding anything in this half. Uh, Pollock, who's in possession now, has had one shot, but that's a part. Uh, kept Middlesbrough quiet, and they did uh, this stage in the first half. Moreno, good running from uh, Moreno, good ball in. Fjorto, there's a return for Barnby. Lovely effort from Nicky Barnby, and a brave clearing header on the line by Gary Bowyer, who's tangled up in the net now. Just coming back into the field of play. Barnby was so close then to his, what would have been his second Middlesbrough goal, scored on his debut. Excellent try from uh, Barber from an acute angle. It's Goodwin who makes sure that Moreno doesn't get a pass in. He's not had the best of returns to first team duty, Jaime Moreno. Barber now twisting, turning. Uh, persistent too. It's Sarah Rotherham and they come away with the ball. Up towards Gota again. We learn it's a great ball in. Fjordov back at a third. Oh, a lamentable finish from uh, an international footballer, really. The ball was delivered beautifully for Fjordov, but he fails to even trouble Matt Clark. That's a smashing ball up to him from Whelan. But Fjordov. Snatched at it really. So Walsh pumps it down the field. Big jump there by Lomas. And uh, good work by Mosto, of course. Barnby under this one. Up against Edshill. Oh, he sent it the wrong way. A beautiful little shimmy there. Went to go to the left, went to the right. Fiatov plays it wide again. And Middlesbrough are buzzing. Here's Hignett. Clipped in again. Fiatov with the back flick. And the shot coming in eventually. Barmy the scorer. 16 minutes gone. His second of the season. And Middlesbrough lead Manchester City by one goal to nil. Look at that back heel there from Fiatov. And in slip Barmby, he got in the goal side of the defenders there. Ghosted in, 1-0. Solid challenge there coming in from uh, Brightwell. Not a bad shot, oh, Walsh didn't hold it first time. Jerry Creaney with the uh, effort there. A right-footed shot. Nicely worked this by Manchester City. And he took a deflection look, so uh, Walsh did well in the end. Pressure on again, headed away by Edgehill. Not too uh, clearly. 
And the Middlesbrough putting the pressure on them again. The header this time from Phelan. And in the end, they scramble it only as far as the uh, centre circle there. And Middlesbrough putting Manchester City under all sorts of pressure here. Pollock. Barmby inside of Fiatov. Fiatov goes down. The shot hits the other side of the bar. Oh! And uh, Mustafa can't put it away. Anguish on his face there. Beautiful touch this by Barmby. Fiatov sets it up. The shot comes in from Musto. And uh, Hignett's head up over the top. Still 1-0, of course, and uh, anything can happen in these situations. Middlesbrough by no means are clear. Brightville there will take the corner. No, in fact, he leaves it to Michael Brown. So, Middlesbrough's turn to defend, and defend in numbers they do. Edgehill controls it, hammers it in, and that was dipping in on goal. Tremendous excitement here. But, uh, main road, Fiatoft, a little bit of magic from him. Away goes Barmby again. Barmby cutting inside, gets the shot in, it was low, it was on target. But Immel got down. The former German national goalkeeper thwarting Barmby this time. Barmby, who's just scored his uh, 22nd goal in his uh, 93rd league game. That's his career record, of course. Former Tottenham Hotspur star. Morris. Bells ringing, everything's happening here as Fiatoft launches another Middlesbrough attack. Beautifully taken there by Cox. Oh, he's such a sweet striker of the ball, this fella. The ball swung across for Neil Cox. Beautifully controlled. Hammers it second time and just wide on the target. Fiatoft stopped by Lomas this time. Manchester City battling hard. trouble uh, matching the quality <laughs> look at that, he doesn't agree with the uh, linesman, this could be a yellow card at least for this sense and I'm sure it will be it really is nonsense because once the decision's given, that's it and no way no amount of stripping off is going to change the official's decisions away we go again, this is Barmby and you've got to say that Middlesbrough are just that much sharper, not only in uh, physical pace, but in thought as well. Fiatov! Oh, it's there! It rolls in off the uh, goalkeeper, but the flag was up. And Jan Agi Fiatov thought he scored there, and he's denied by the linesman's flag. Deep ball, headed back again. Oh, it's not out of the way yet. And a free kick's being given to Middlesbrough. The referee right on the spot. Creaney didn't like it. So here goes Bigri. Tantalising winger at times. He frustrates his uh, colleagues so often because they don't know what he's going to do. Oh! was nowhere near it. Beautiful shot from Nicky Summerby, the uh, former Swindon Town player. But still 1-0 it is. Immel has given that one away. Fiatov trying to... Uh... Well, the girl was gaping, but the shot was off target for the Norwegian striker. Good thinking from him, though. 
come City. It's a chance here for the doing of things. Summerby, a good ball across from Summerby. And uh, good defending too from White. Here goes Hignett. He's got Pollock in support. Decides to spread it to Barmby. Control football again. Oh! Akiva did well. Imol just got the vital touch. Because that was surely going into the net. And Fiatov denied again there. Shot coming in. And it was just the touch of the goalkeeper. So far, Buller's great start to the season exceeded all expectations. So much so that confidence was sky high on the day champions Blackburn arrived on Seaside. Rovers still recovering from midweek embarrassment in the European Cup against part-timers Rosenborg. I think it's, uh, it's going to go this afternoon then against Blackburn, lads. I think we'll win 1-0. One, one Who do you fancy to score? Uh, maybe Jim Pollock. Jim Pollock, I think he's going to come forward from midfield and score one? Yeah, because he's getting a bit of stick lately. Former fans don't, don't like him, but I think he might prove people wrong today. He's a good player. Just hope he gets a goal, prove them wrong. What about Alan Shearer? Don't you think he's going to come and score something? No, I just having five at the back. Tough, strong. The black men have had a good beat by part time, so I hope Burke can do it. Who's, who's your favourite player? Derek White. Man, right. Man's Craig Ignace. Do you think Craig Ignace is going to score today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think they're going to do? I think they're going to win two or three now. Going to win two or three now. Yeah. All right, Brian, today. Big match, it's the champions against the champions, as it were. It's the first division champions against the premier champions. It maybe net last May, would that have been a, a good choice to imagine that you Blackburn would arrive here at the Selnet Riverside Stadium with us in, above them in the premiership table? Well, it's great for everybody involved in the club, isn't it? You know, um, if, like you're saying, Dave, uh, when we're talking last, last season at this time, um, you know, we were going well in the first division, but. Um, Today it's far better being in the Premier League, isn't it? You know, we're sitting seventh at the moment, uh, but it'll be a tough game. Uh, Blackburn haven't particularly had a good run of late, but uh, they've got some quality players in the side, and we know it's going to be a tough game today. Yeah, you say a tough game. Blackburn haven't made the best of starts to the season. Are you expecting any sort of lashback um, from them after a poor result in Europe, especially during the week? I think we will. I mean, any professional football players always got pride in the performance and Blackburn will be uh, disappointed about their performance in the week. Um, against Coventry last week they, they seemed as if they'd got everything back together and they were going well again. Uh, but the the result in the week will have uh, disappointed them and so I'd, I think if, if at any time we were going to play Blackburn this is a good time to catch them because I think they've had um, effects from winning the championship last year and the players are finding it difficult to get going again this season uh, so that gives us a chance against them everyone knows about alan shearer he's, he's such a, a great striker you know one of the best strikers in europe and you know hopefully we'll, we'll be keeping, keeping him tightly marked today but this is what the games are about you know coming here in the new stadium and you know everyone's looking forward to it i've been fortunate to, to play in a lot of great stadiums and I rate um, this stadium perhaps the best one I've ever played and the atmosphere is fantastic and it helps being a Middlesbrough player here because I think they put our position under pressure and that's I think the crowd is all about. Pre-match confidence was well justified. Borough produced their best display of the season so far. Well, Flowers almost caught out with that one. Very important game this for Blackburn Rovers, who've had such a terrible start to their season, but uh, Hignett showing the skills there. Oh, beautiful effort! Robbie Musto really got hold of that one. And giving notice just uh, the sort of business that Middlesbrough need, mean took it inside on the left foot and uh, Flowers struggling a little with that one. Middlesbrough playing some beautiful football. Musto shot there, over the top it goes. 
So Middlesbrough still uh, stroking the ball around confidently. Still no score here, though, at the Riverside Stadium. Cox. Pollock with a shot. Oh, brilliant save by Flowers. Jamie Pollock really hammered that one, and I think the power of the shot has hurt Tim Flowers, the England goalkeeper. He got his hand to it, he might have even caught the wrist. Oh, it's his shoulder that he's holding. The ball laid back beautifully here by Cox, wrong-footed the defenders. And he got his palm of his hand to it, look. It must have been the fall that uh, did the damage. On with the show. Nicely taken by Flowers, showing no ill effects there. England's number one. <laughs> well, that's a nice little moment, isn't it? The Norwegian number one, or number nine, rather, against the England number one. Despite all the tensions, you can still have fun at this level. It's not so much fun at the moment for the uh, Blackburn defence. Chance here, 1-0. Barnby, inevitably. Morris was in there. Right on half-time. And Middlesbrough lead the Premiership champions by one goal to nil. The Blackburn defence just caught on the turn here. Morris hammers it across, and Barnby got the last touch. So, a great uh, boost for Middlesbrough just before the interval. And really, there were enough defenders there to deal with the situation, but they didn't mark tight. So, Middlesbrough really on a high. Blackburn desperate to get back on level terms. Kenner. Oh, Walsh making a meal of that one, but he got it away eventually. The header coming in from Henry. And that was just wide of the target. He's so dangerous in the air. And Walsh failed to get that first effort. Scrambled it away. There, he dropped the ball there, punched it away, but back in it came. And uh, Hendry so close. Good control. This is an aspect of uh, Middlesbrough's display this season, I think, the individual technique, the control of the players. But a chance here for 1-1. Walsh got his hand to it. And Tim Sherwood was denied. Sherwood, supporting the attack here, made the run well. But just the touch from uh, Walsh was enough. Slow motion uh, collision there. The referee plays on. Blackburn still in possession. It's on the break that uh, Middlesbrough so dangerous. Fiatov pulling away to the left. Tripped there, was it? Just wide of the post it went. Well, he felt he was tripped. The referee didn't. And a goal kick it is. Nick Barnby almost in again. He's gone for the return ball here. Look, beautifully clipped across. Is this a foul or is it not? Well, it looked like it to me. The contact was definitely made before uh, the ball was played. Still 1-0 here then between Middlesbrough and Blackburn Rovers. And away goes Barnby again. Beautiful ball through, Fiatov wants it square. No need, it's 2 now. He got the scorer. 61 minutes into this game. And Middlesbrough lead Blackburn Rovers by two goals to nil. The build-up superb, the finish supreme. Another of those little back flicks there from Fiatoft. He's always involved, isn't he? Here's Hignett. 
Fiatov's in the middle if he wants him. He plays it off the right post. Beautiful little pass through, too, from Barmby. Hignett on the ball now. Fiatov's in the middle. He's taking one of the defenders' attentions. And 2-0 it is to Middlesbrough. Well, here's an unusual view. Same result, 2-0. Well, the Craig Hignett, uh, Barmby, Fiatov combination is so good to watch. A chance here maybe for Fiatov. Flowers sticks out the left leg. Jan Aggie Fiatov, he's so good at finding the angles. And uh, Tim Flowers had to be at his best there. A corner it is. I think if you take the opposition into uh, consideration, you know, we are playing the champions. And I was delighted with the way the lads play because we, I think we only give Blackburn sort of one one chance where Guy Walsh made a great save. Um, and apart from that, we, we contained them well, but we always look threatening when we were attacking them. So it was a pleasing performance. I think it's sixth it takes the Borough up to in the Premiership now. Arsenal obviously had a hiccup today. How high, the fans are asking, can they go? They're surprised by the start. Have you always been confident of uh, the potential of this squad? Well, there's a long way to go yet, but um, they're doing themselves justice at the moment. Um, we've just got to keep working on it. And as long as they can keep improving all the time, um, they've got nothing to fear in this league, you know, they, they're here to enjoy it. Um, and that's what the lads are doing at the moment, they're enjoying the football and they're getting good results. Victory over Blackburn was indeed a big boost, both in terms of morale and league position. Unbeaten in the month of September, Borough were now in the top seven, just two points behind second place Aston Villa. Progress around three of the Coca-Cola Cup was confirmed against Rotherham at Millmore. For a slender 2-1 lead from the first leg at the Riverside, gave the second division side hope of springing an upset. The Borough were not ready to be giant killed. Steve Vickers completed a 3-1 aggregate win with the only goal on the night. Vickers' killer strike came at the start of the second half. A finely taken effort by Vickers, and there was no way back for the Minnows. Meanwhile, England's friendly international with Norway meant Borough teammates Barmby and Fjortov faced a showdown in Oslo. An interesting head-to-head -head between two players with great respect for one another. It'll be brilliant, you know, for myself to, to keep in the England squad, and you know, hopefully, you know, if I am picked up, you know, I'll be looking forward to to playing. In Norway, you know, to be involved in Norway because you know the very strong side, and obviously it'd be nice to, to play against. Yeah. And has there been a bit of a leg pulling between yourself and Jan about it? Just who's going to win that match? Oh, I will. You know, between all the lads as well. You know, everyone gets tucked into Jan and being Norwegian, so you know, hopefully uh, England can get the right result. You say you hope to be the winner. Just how highly do you rate Nick Barnby in his future career with England? I mean, he's one of the everything can be said in the papers about him and his prospects for the game and uh, he, he has impressed so far by, by Middlesbrough and he will have a, a long career uh, and uh, I've got a lot of caps now and if he can cope that one one day and uh, and I sure he will because I think he, he is one of the England, England players that they, they are for the future because his movement and he is a very good technique player and that's the future of the game. While Barmby and Fjortov prepared for a contest that was to end goalless, the real benefactor of a blank premiership weekend was Brian Robson. Robbo was in Brazil signing up the hottest property in South America. Chizino, a 22-year-old with the world at his feet. The cost, less than £5 million.
Back home, Borough fans celebrated by snapping up the last remaining season tickets. Janino was on his way to Teesside, and Middlesbrough was suddenly the in place to be. Is it is it worth queuing all this time to, to get the Borough De tickets? Definitely, definitely. I mean, Gino's on his way now, and you know, there's no stopping us now. Only places up. Meanwhile, 48 hours before Gino was due to arrive on Teesside, Borough had a Sunday showdown with Sheffield Wednesday at Hillsborough. Already, the increased interest in Borough could be measured by the size of Borough's travelling support. Expectations, too, were also raised, and the fans were not disappointed. It has been a strained year for Sheffield Wednesday. Last season, with that struggle, coming to the end of Trevor Francis's time as manager. The upshot is just five league wins since the start of February. Five in 23 games in the Premiership. Beautifully played by Cox, a wonderful touch, beaten away by Pressman. And he's there to deal with the follow-up from Barbie. Well, I'd have taken some beat if he'd have driven that in the top left-hand corner. I know they've just signed a Brazilian, but this is, well, skill right out of the Brazilian textbook. Outside of the right foot, knows exactly what he's doing, he's almost flicking it and moving at the same time. Super save from the goalkeeper, and he's up quickly on his feet again. Kevin Pressman, he's saved the header. Oh! Tough to enjoy, came from Neil Cox. Showed for it well. Great skill in a fiercely hit shot. Aiden's corner not quite deep enough. Bob oh, White on defensive duty as Vickers and Pearson have gone out. Aiden's. Worth a try. Sweetly, sweetly struck from Craig Higman. Never threatening the goals, always a couple of yards wide. We've got a lovely angle of that from where you and I are sitting. It was always a couple of yards wide, but we can admire the quality of the strike. Very sweet move. Well, goal's an important part of his game. He's been supplying them this season. Not far away, though. Robin finding a change of pace. And Middlesbrough concerned, not wanting to dive in, but Robin's lost the ball and the break on a pace led by Barbie. Hendry, well saved, good shot. Looked as though it might well have been arrowing towards its target across the goalkeeper. Preston made sure it didn't get across, but suddenly the ball's given away. And Middlesbrough might be back in business. And Hendry again. Hendry got in front of Walker well to steer it back to Barbie. Two running to the right of Barbie in Middlesbrough red. Further away is Cox of the two. And they swept forward again to produce another notch on the corner count. Vickers is certainly a danger to Sheffield Wednesday. Nigel Pearson, they know all about him as well. That is Vickers. Behind Raymer. Handball. Handball has been given and Gerald Ashby points for the penalty. I don't know he's indicating to push Gerald Ashby. Certainly looked from here as if the arm, uh, the arm pointed to it. Well, Vickers headed it back across the face of the goal and won the crucial battle there. It drops it. Briscoe, yeah. Lee Briscoe. Took his eye off the ball, lost it, took his eye off it. Instinctively, the left arm goes up. Referee's got no option but to give a pen. Craig Hignett will take it for Middlesbrough. Halfway through the second half. And he scores! The player most likely to be threatened with his place in the side by the arrival of Juninho. Well, he's the man in possession. And he's punished the error by Briscoe. And a game that certainly looked as though it was going to produce a goal has done from the penalty spot from Hignett. It's a good finish. Crespin goes positively and solidly to his left. 
And if the penalty isn't struck firmly and accurately, then the goalkeeper saves that. Good penalty. Ignit to clip it across. Oh! What a header from Cox. Neil Cox oh. rattled the frame of the goal. Musto might score here. Pressman gets a hand to it. Now is that a back pass? Play on, says the referee. What a great save from Pressman. <laughs> well, it all happened within 15 seconds here. as it comes out here. Pearson thinks, look at Coxley's arm up at the back post, and watch this for a header, attacks it, power! Well, oh, Peter Atherton did well to just get it away. That was a super header from Cox, and then a great save from Pressman. Borough are now in fourth place in the Premiership. And the boy from Brazil was still to arrive on Teesside. Chugino was to make his entrance the very next morning, escorted on a private jet by Borough's chief executive, Keith Lamb. And we were there too to bring you these exclusive How pictures. Good morning. How are you? Welcome to Teesside Airport, Ron Dias. You are going to put this on to keep you warm. And here's some t shirts Gianni. for your children and your family. Okay. 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 Okay nor had anyone else at Borough for that matter. This really was the moment to cherish. Morning, gents. Uh, well, as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I look about this room um, and I can see what interest it has created, uh, bringing Juninho to Middlesbrough. Um, I think uh, there's not one sort of person missing from the media world today, um, and that shows um, what charisma Juninho has brought to our football club. Um, I believe that the lad will enjoy his football with us. Uh, we try to pass the ball, which will suit his game. Uh, people talking, you know, in this country about him settling in. Uh, to the English environment, but um, I know he's a tough character. He wants to try and be the best player in the world, um, and I'm sure he'll work hard and he'll try everything um, within himself to try and achieve that. Can I ask one more question? Does he know how cold it gets in Middlesbrough in January? <laughs> He doesn't think that uh, in England could be that uh, terrible, you know, different from any, uh, you know, it's not uh, Siberia. But, uh, I was just going to say, we are, we are at Middlesbrough, we're not on the North Pole. He said, he's a centre. He also said that everybody's been asking this question to him a lot, so he's expecting a monster. Can I ask one? He's not getting a club car, he's getting a snow plow. They're great foundations at the club here, but now you've brought in Eugenio. Do you feel this is a real spot that could make the club take off? Yeah, I mean, we, we're doing well uh, before the arrival of Giannino. He's, just, he's come in and he's come in as uh, another member of the squad. We are constantly looking to improve the playing staff at the football club. Brian makes the decisions on that. He's been tracking Giannino uh, since the Umbro Cup and I think maybe even before then. And it's all tribute to him and to Keith Lamb. They've spent a lot of time in Brazil. There's a lot of things that have happened that have gone unnoticed and, uh, and the press aren't aware of. But it's been uh, a huge amount of work uh, by the two of them to deliver Janino. Uh, we believe that in the style that Brian wants to play, that he can fit in and that he can make a significant contribution, contribution to our further progress. 
Canino would have to wait until November before he was eligible to make his Borough debut. Meanwhile, his new teammates were doing pretty well without him. At home to Queen's Park Rangers, Borough were seeking their seventh successive win. Rangers arrived at the Riverside with a good away record, but Borough began in confident fashion. And they made a perfect start when Nick Barmby won a penalty with just a quarter of an hour gone. Rangers felt hard done by, although referee Mike Reed looked in no doubt. The replay shows why Rangers can feel aggrieved, but there's no point in looking a gift horse in the mouth. And that gave Craig Hignett the chance to score his third goal in four matches. Hignett then lining up for his second successive penalty. And once again, it proved a decisive strike. It was almost a repeat story in the second half. Once again, it was a jinxing run by Barnby. This time, Carl Reddy, the culprit. And this time, the Rangers' protest, much more persistent. The protests were all in vain, of course, but they needn't have bothered because a spot kick was missed by Jan Arger Fjortoft. He must have wished he'd let Hignett take it. It was a miss that could have proved costly, and Rangers were left kicking themselves when Gary Walsh was beaten by Trevor Sinclair midway through the second half. The ball came back off the woodwork, and Daniel Diccio missed the easiest of chances. Can you explain to all our viewers what happened about the penalty? Everyone would have assumed you would have taken the second one. Well, uh, we've got three penalty takers. I mean, me, Nick Barnby or Jan, whoever fancies it at the time. And uh, after the first one, Jan said, if we get another one, can I take it? And foolishly, I said, yeah, you can. And uh, so it's down to me, really, letting him take it. But he's held his hands up and he said it was his fault. And Have there been words about it in the dressing room? Yeah, there have. There have. But uh, obviously, everything stays in the dressing room. We don't bring that out here. Queen's Park Rangers put up a good fight today, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Uh, I think people will think we're a bit fortunate to come away with a win. Uh, Maybe a draw would have been a fair result, but they played really well. Yeah, I was impressed with them. Now, in the past week, I'm sure you're absolutely fed up of people asking you about your new signing, but you are making it very difficult for Brian Robson to leave you out this side. Well, I hope so, but that's what having a big squad's all about. You know, the quality players that we're bringing in now uh, is fantastic for the club, and it's fantastic for the players as well. Uh, since Nick's came, I think that the whole team's raised the game. Uh, hopefully, when Janino comes, the same thing will happen. You must be playing the best football of your career, would you agree? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think the team playing the formation they are with two and behind suits both myself and Nick down to the ground and, uh, you know, I've enjoyed it this year. Now, everyone assumes it's you that's under threat. Why is that? It could be I don't player. know. You'd have to ask the manager. Uh, I think it's because he plays in behind. Obviously, people are looking at him. He plays for Brazil. Uh, Nick plays for England, so I'm the odd one out. Are you ready to have to accept this tough decision the manager is going to have to make? I'll have to accept it, I think, but uh, obviously everyone wants to play in the team every week, so you won't be happy if you've been left out. You can't do much more than you're doing, can you? No, no, the second pen would have been nice, but... Thank you for talking to us. Thanks a lot. Once again, Craig Hignett let his boots do the talking. In the Coca-Cola Cup at Crystal Palace, Hignett took his tally to four goals in five games. But first, Borough were dealt a real shot by the first division side. Dean Gordon. Dyer's made the run out wide. McKenzie has gone into a central position and oh. raised. Keen to get involved. Oh. Looking for McKenzie. That's a goal. Hopkin comes in for the wide position. McKenzie was in the middle there. And Palace have made a stunning start. Well, what a shot for the Premiership boys there. That ball flung in towards the normally safe 
defence. And there, at the far post, David Hopkin. Shaw, looking it towards Dyke, good layoff there for Hopkin. Hopkin onto the left foot. That's a second goal, it got a deflection off Whelan. David Hopkin can do no wrong, but Boas' defence, and on that occasion the hapless Phil Whelan, their world is falling apart. This is a stunning start indeed by Paris. That was good running, a good layoff from Dyer, and a confident finish came inside his man. There was a deflection, and that gave Gary Walsh no chance. Barnby, Pollock. Hignett making a good run, still got plenty to beat, and Barnby letting it go. Fjortov Barnby, that's a superb goal from Middlesbrough. And Nicky Barnby, their man of the season, brings them back in contention here. Super passing skills, though, applauded by the Borough fans. Finished off by Nicky Barnby, his fourth of the season. Fjortov very much the pivot for it. There was the first run, and there the return, and there there's the finish, and that's 2-1 now. And Middlesbrough no doubt will feel they're very much alive. Look at Barnby's running and combination there with Hignett. Such quick thinking to let it run. Great return, exemplary finish, 2-1. What a game we've got now. Whelan. Fjortov, another well, good layoff there. Hignett is through. Hignett now looking for the equaliser. And there it is. Craig Hignett, 2 2. And the double act does it again. Barbie the first, Hignett the second. And you just can't stop those two. It's all turned around now for Middlesbrough. Another sharp goal full of. Movement. Hignett was onto it. Are you watching Juninho? He says, I can finish as well. Just thinking it over the keeper for 2 2. Borough's unbeaten run was now 10 matches. And next on the agenda, an away date with Man United. Brian Robson received a standing ovation on his return to Old Trafford, a great reception by his former club, relayed by Close Circuit TV to an army of Borough fans watching on a giant screen back at the Riverside Stadium. Middlesbrough digging in here in the opening stages. In uh, plenty of situations already with United with possession, looking for a penetrating pass. Well, they've got one from Bruce Cantona. Great try, terrific stop from Gary Walsh. The former Manchester United man. And Cantona denied by an old colleague here. But Bruce suddenly with a longer pass opened Middlesbrough up. Cantona made it possible with his movement. Fantastic technique to get the shot on target. New ground, progressive young chairman, Brian Robson, the manager. Juninho signed from Brazil, really on the strength of uh, Brian Robson's personal approach. Fjortoft. It's Morris, and that's some serious work for Schmeichel, and he's done it very well indeed. Chris Morris coming down the left-hand side and making the extra man in the attack, and United couldn't cover the run, but the goalkeeper covered the shot and was quick enough and alert enough to get up and catch the ball as it dropped as well. Gets it back to Keane. Giggs. Musto. But uh, Mickey Butt and Roy Keane trying to run the show in midfield. Oh, now Keane has pushed out here. And Roy Keane goes off. A player who invariably gets himself embroiled in the wrong type of aggression. He's sent off for the second time this season. We've not yet had half an hour, and Alec Ferguson must shake his head. 
Pallister's up. Walsh with a fist. Pallister's header! seconds before half time the 10 men take the lead neither manager incident again going with a substitute goalkeeper and their selection of three well kept in by Bambi Moore with the cross put just where Gary Pallister likes it and he'll head those away for fun Pollock Moreno well Middlesbrough feel that there was a foul there and Stephen Lodge, who was pretty close to the episode, didn't reach for his whistle. Giggs. And Cole able to get it back against Pearson. Cantona in the centre. Only Cantona. Giggs. Offside, the late arrival was Dennis Irwin, doesn't count. But Irwin comes from uh, Southern Ireland, an area very close to Keane. Well, that looked a penalty to me. Pallister on Moreno, not given. Crowd trying to shout United home here. Canton, <laughs> not quite the situation for that, but uh, Middlesbrough are baffled by it. Canton now ploughs on. Great tip through for Cole. Still Cole. It hit walls. It spun in. And that's the match for Manchester United. The recent agony is over for Andy Cole. Three minutes to go. A look at the final table for October confirmed what a great start Borough had made on their Premiership return. A place in the top six and level on points with Arsenal and Nottingham Forest. The gap behind leaders Newcastle, just seven points. In six dramatic months, Middlesbrough Football Club have given Teesside a new pride and a new identity. A club reborn with a new stadium, a new look team and a new optimism. The future looks an exciting one and the world waits to see just what an impact Gigino will make to the Riverside Revolution. Follow the fortunes of the boy from Brazil in our next action pack video. Superlatives are much overused in a game of football, but this is a tribute to a man for whom no accolade is too great. Born as Valdo Geraldo Jr. on the 22nd of February 1973, Janinho is one of the all-time greats. The boy wonder from Brazil is truly a legend in his own lifetime, a genius with magical soccer skills. It all began in October 1995. 
Bran Robson took the world of soccer by surprise when he persuaded the little fella to join his newly promoted side. The fee just £4.75 million from Sao Paulo. Middlesbrough had found themselves a real bargain. centre of worldwide attention and Janinho was given a welcome of astonishing magnitude by the euphoric seaside public. Morning gents. Uh, well as, as far as I'm concerned you know I look about this room um, and I can see what interest it has created uh, bringing Janinho to Middlesbrough. Um, I think uh, there's not one sort of person missing from the media world today, um, and that shows uh, what charisma Juninho has brought to our football club. Um, I believe that the lad will enjoy his football with us. Uh, we try to pass the ball, which will suit his game. Uh, people talk in, you know, in this country about him settling in uh, to the English environment, but um, I know he's a tough character. He wants to try and be the best player in the world um, and I'm sure he'll work hard and he'll try everything um, within himself to try and achieve that. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, when I've got a player who is committed like that, um, those are the type of players I want in my football club. Uh, we're looking forward to him playing for the team. Uh, all the players uh, relishing him coming in training with them. Uh, and I'm sure Juninho will enjoy it. What do you think of Juninho? Class? 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 The best. You wouldn't have got this much reception if the Queen had turned up. There you go. The smell is good. <laughs> you think is going to put Middlesbrough on the map now? Yeah. Middlesbrough's yeah. already on the map look, with the team. Look out, on. Newcastle. We're going to knock you off the top. OK, lads, you've got your photos. We are constantly looking to improve the playing staff at the football club. Brian makes the decisions on that. He's been tracking Janino uh, since the Umbro Cup and I think maybe even before then. And it's all tribute to him and to Keith Lamb. They've spent a lot of time in Brazil. There's a lot of things that have happened that have gone unnoticed and, uh, and the press aren't aware of, but it's been uh, a huge amount of work uh, by the two of them to deliver Janino. Uh, we believe that in the style that Brian wants to play, that he can fit in and that he can make a significant contribution, contribution to our further progress. Graham, the fans have gone home now, but it's been a great day for Middlesbrough Football Club. A tremendous day for Middlesbrough Football Club, yeah. One that the fans and everybody that works for the club will remember for a long, long time. We haven't seen him play yet and we're all excited already. Big days here, Brian. Uh, looking forward to it. Well, they're all big days, but um, I know with all the publicity, it's um, everybody's looking forward to today's game because of Juninho. He's just arrived, so the fans are getting their first taste of him at the ground. Have you had a chance to have a chat with him about the day? Have you given him any special instructions about you know how to handle the pressure? No, I mean I, I keep saying this about pressure. Um, you know, he, he was Brazilian Player of the Year. He, he's played for Brazil over 20 times, and that. Um, being classed as the best player in Brazil, that, that's pressure in itself. Uh, so he's used to all the hype that goes on around games and that, and um, you know, I'm sure he'll take it in his stride today. You've trained with him for a week. What have you seen of him in training? I mean, does he impress in training? Yeah, I mean, he's 
for me is outstanding. Uh, I was fortunate to see him uh, in the Umbro Cup in the summer and I thought he was outstanding then. And to actually sign a, a player of Janino's class just shows the ambition of the club and you know the lads will be working hard again today and you know that's a good thing with Janino's game, although he's, he's a world class player, he'll work hard for the team and you know that's why Brian Robson's bought him as well. So like I say it'd be very nice uh, to see him play and all, all week in training the lads have been, you know, admiring his skills and you know hopefully he can perform today. The air of expectation was almost overpowering at Janino's first match in a Middlesbrough shirt. The eyes of the world were very much on the Selnet Riverside Stadium on the day Janino made his debut against Leeds United, watched by a new and colourful army of excited fans and his proud parents who were also making their home on Seaside. Good tackling back though by the Middlesbrough man. Oh, Kelly's missed it. Now Janino could be away. He's away from the Callister. Slips it through to Fjortoft. Great chance for Middlesbrough. And it's a goal for Middlesbrough. And Janino makes his presence felt. Ten minutes into his debut with a defence splitting pass that puts Leeds a goal down. There's a volcanic eruption at the Riverside Stadium as Middlesbrough open the scoring and the Brazilian makes his first real impact. Obviously fitting Janino in is going to take time to gel, but uh, the, what, the way he started must give you cause for promise. Yes, it does. There was a lot of good movement uh, with our front players um, and things which we can work on. Uh, so it did look bright and once the lads settle down uh, here, you know, and he, he gets into the training routines and gets used to the players, then uh, hopefully we can even see more f uh, of that type of football from him. I can't believe he got booked. It's, it's, it's quite funny. He gets kicked all over the place and then he gets booked. But all right, that's good for him. It's his first yellow card in England, so perhaps it's a good start for him. Skills, Juninho all the way, and the ball for Robson. Yes, oh, that would have had real symmetry about it. Fiortov, Juninho. Now, what can he do here? Still, he has it. Juninho, Palm is in. He's like a hot knife through butter. He just seems to cut through defences. Just trying to slip it into Barnes. But inevitably almost Pollock won it now, Janino. Maketeer cuts across him. Fiortov stayed on side. Oh, blistering shot. And Liverpool can play it out in safety. No, I was saying that the people here are very friends. Um, he came, it's been very nice since he came, people have been very kind to him, he's been able to relax into it. And he wants to say that he didn't come here to take anyone's place, he came to help the team fit in and he feels that that's happening. Here goes Phil Stamp, the whole stadium is on his feet! Estou gostando bastante o, o lugar também em He's very happy here. The area he's living in is very quiet, which he likes, and the neighbors are wonderful. So he's very happy. Feliz aqui. Some late glory still in this. Good save 
again from Bosnich after Janino's run. The run being made on the right by Dibble. Here he is. Can he deliver the cross? Bobbled at him. He had to control it. Pure top. Brilliant control. A chance here. One one. Janino, the scorer. The stand rises in appreciation. It's only his second goal since arriving here on Seaside. But what a golden opportunity it was. And what about English football? Is he enjoying playing English football? Está gostando do jogo inglês? Não, o jogo inglês é um jogo bastante disputado, né? Bastante corrido. É dificilmente você vê a bola. It's a very fast game. The game, the ball doesn't go out of play for very long, and also there are a lot of high balls, which is they're a bit difficult for him. Que está me dificultando um pouco, mas do resto está tudo bem. How does it differ to Brazilian football? Qual é a diferença entre o jogo inglês e o jogo brasileiro? O jogo brasileiro é um jogo mais cadenciado, não? It's a lot slower. It's a lot more rhythm paced. Um, there's a lot more touch of the ball, and um, a lot they get a lot more opportunity to pass the ball. But the game really has picked up tempo now. Fleming bursting forward. Freestone and Fjortoft up ahead. Fjortoft though goes bobbing through. This could be a good goal. It's Freestone! Freestone couldn't provide the finish, but what a run from this man. But interestingly, if there is any question mark against Freestone's fitness with this sort of lead, it would be a nice time to bring on the other youngster. Middlesbrough going wild, Janine! But is he settling into English football? Is he now enjoying it? Mas agora você gosta do jogo aqui? Gosto, ou? gosto, okay. gosto muito. Yeah. E até minha. Yes, he is settling into it, and he likes it. And the fact that wherever he goes, the stadiums are full, it really motivates him to play well and enjoy it. Yes, he is settling. Janinho had wasted no time settling in at the Riverside, and one of his great success. Flick it through for more. Got there. Now back. And he's got his goal. Good finish. So Denmark got their name to the scoreline. Janinho with the corner kick. Beck right on the goal line. Here he is with the header. Musto, Janino, Ravanelli begins his run, and here is Ravanelli, Schmeichel's out, and Ravanelli scored! into the path of Juninho and here's Ravanelli and here's number three look at the celebrations behind Ravanelli and Juninho this is Fleming looking to get back away that's a good ball can Beck do it oh he's beaten Bosnich 2-0 
Janina. Three stone. Emerson! They're back in front! Well, would you believe this game? <laughs> It would seem Juninho again. Mustn't pass it. Well, he does to Ravanelli. But one stage looked offside, but now completes his hat trick. They're being torn apart, but they have so overcommitted themselves, Derby County.
taken too long. Janinho! They couldn't keep the little genius in the bottle for 90 minutes. Janinho. Hates it. Janinho, brilliant play. Oh, Janinho for Middlesbrough. Fabulous goal. Oh, wonderful goal, the way it was made and taken by the little Brazilian. And Middlesbrough are in front. It up well, but uh, directing is a ball. Oh, beautifully judged ball, that one. And Janinho's in, third time, lucky shorty. Yes, it's 2-0. And Janinho hits his 11th goal of the season. An individual effort that he ran half the length of the field. What a well-judged ball that was. Juninho, midway inside his own half, made coverage to Ravanelli, and then up on one side of the middle space, and it's to work. If Ravanelli looks at he can find Stamp. Stamp does to Juninho. Juninho, surely! And Juninho breaks the deadlock! The spark of genius who are calling for is provided predictably by the Brazilian. was on his way to Wembley, not just once but twice. A dream come true for the people's champion and his adoring fans. You guess who's your favourite player? Do you know you're... <laughs> no. <laughs> class. It's class. It's class. 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 Yes. 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 What does Wembley mean to to players in England? Is it special? Yes. Very special because uh, every game in, in Wembley is, is the final, is a, a very important game. So it's, it's important uh, most for for English player. So have a uh, opportunity that that play in, in wonderful ground. Training at Bisham Abbey under the watchful eye of Brian Robson, Giannino looked every inch the thoroughbred, preparing for the big stage. Who's your favourite player? Janinho. You like Janinho. Why, why do you like Janinho? Because I think he's good at scoring goals. Why are you so confident? Because we've got the best team in the country at the moment, I do believe that. We've got the best player in the country, I know that, Janinho. Uh, we're, 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 I think we're, we're the form team at the moment, so I'm quite confident we can put it over on Leicester. I saw them play, us play them the other week and we took them apart, so I think we'll do it tomorrow. Have a nice big open pitch. Players who can perform on the big stage, like Janino, like Rav, like Emo, like Beck, you know, the list goes on. I've watched over the last 20, 30 years every cup final has ever been, and I've dreamt of Middlesbrough, my team, being there. Tomorrow we go there, we're there. Um, you know, if we win, great. I mean, but we're there, we're at Wembley, major cup final. I can't, I can't ask for any more. I mean, from my supporting, oh, you know, win, great, lose, we'll still be bloody singing. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Who's your favourite player? Janinho. You like Janinho? Yeah, I like Janinho. Who's your favourite player? 
like Janinho there? Who's yours? Janinho. Are you enjoying this? Yeah, what is you get As you can see, as soon as the camera gets switched, it's going to get mobbed by Middlesbrough fans. They're at Wembley, they're at Trafalgar Square on midnight just before the game. Honesty. Look at that. Honest. Honest. Mm. Yeah. The worst tie that I've ever seen. <laughs> 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 Play! What? He's <laughs> <laughs> the best thing since sliced bread, isn't he, Janino? He's the best thing I've seen in the middles with shit. Janino. <laughs> Disappointment? Are you feeling? <laughs> I can't explain my disappointment because the the game was in, in our hands. So, but sorry, never mind. We we have to think now in the the next game to play. fans will never forgive the FA for the punishment that would eventually mean relegation and the end of Janino's love affair with Teesside. The board considers that a deduction of three points and a fine of £50,000 is right and fair. I'm just saying Middlesbrough have reached the FA Cup final puts a smile on supporters' faces. Is it the sort of game you can now lift yourself up from the disappointments of yesterday? Yeah, it was, we had, a, for me, a great season. We had great games. We, we proved that we, we have a good team. Uh, we get to cup finals. So we have to prove that we, we have a good team. On, on Saturday, we, we, have, we have beat Chelsea at home. And we have chance to beat uh, again. Chelsea is uh, a team that like play the ball, and when we we play the team like Chelsea, who, we play very well. Uh, you finished number one in the fans' vote of Borough's favourite players, and you finished number two with the players' vote. You've only been here two seasons, Janinho. Is, is it pleasing to, to to be given these these plaudits from from fellow players, from the fans? They like you. Yeah. <clears throat> very pleased for me. Um, I came here to, to help Middlesbrough win something, so we didn't get yet in, in the league, in the, in the cup, we have, we have a chance now in the, in the FA Cup, so I'm very, I'm, I'm very glad to, to the fans show me best, the best player here, so I had no uh, opportunity to, to watch players like Benz, uh, play, uh, so I can talk about this player because just looking in the in the video, that's not not the same. So I'm very glad. In the book, 70s star man Graham Souness won the vote for Borough's number one all-time player. But for many, Janinho will always be the number one, despite missing out on this occasion. He was in second position. He's not been with us too long, but he certainly is a Borough hero. He joined the Borough for 4.7 million 
pounds from Sao Paulo, Juninho. Bobby, with Janino, uh, no, well, old, old and the new, say some of the fans of my yeah. age. I like the old, yes, yeah. it's tremendous. It, uh, I love watching them on the television, you know, we're up far away up in Scotland, but uh, the, only, the only one is Janino. He doesn't know that my children were, went to school here and uh, they always watch borough matches on television. And he's a man. <laughs> yes, what, do you, a man. what do you know of Bobby Murdoch, Janino? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> uh, I had no, no chance to, to watch that's, that's great players mm. uh, in the action. Mm -hmm. So McQueen, Gordon McQueen told me about him, that he was, was a wonderful player, played from the Celtic. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't uh, can say uh, uh, a lot of things because I, I did watch that play. But if he, if he wasn't in the book, uh, I'm sure that he, they uh, went a good goal. Uh, and obviously a European champion as well, Bobby Murdoch, European when he was champ, good. Yeah. Uh -huh. I played against a uh, racing club, mm -hmm. Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. Argentina. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, uh, in, the, in the final. In the final? Yeah, uh, uh, the World Club Championship. Oh. We lost just. <laughs> <laughs> we won, we won one won game, final. lost one game, mm -hmm. and then lost another game. Oh, yeah. But, uh, oh, Argentinians, man. Uh, oh, so man. Man. <laughs> top, top, top. Uh, have to be uh, careful with your uh, legs. Yes, uh, you have. What do you think of Middlesbrough supporters, the fans? Great, great. Uh, um, they, they support you in, in, in bad, bad moments. That's the, the real supporters. When, when support you in the bad things, in the bad moments. So that's the, the great support. Because you may face a very difficult decision. We don't know how it's going to turn out. There may come a point shortly where you might have to decide to leave to keep your Brazil position for France World Cup 98 yeah. uh, in, in the foremost of your mind. Yeah. How difficult from the supporters' point of view would it be for you to leave Middlesbrough? Would you miss the supporters, the fans? Yeah. I will. I have to think in my, my career. I'm, I'm young. I'm still young, so I have to think in, in my career. I have to do what's best for me. And if I live in Middlesbrough, I will miss the, the support. I will miss the, the friends that I, I made here. You looked at Higgy there as your friend? Yeah, he's my friend. Yeah. And you miss all that? that, that yeah, I miss all that because we, we had a great season, uh, great fun. Yeah, so. I, I, of course, when you leave it, when you leave a team that you played for two years, you miss a lot of things. Have you made your mind up yet? Do you know what you're doing? I don't know yet. You don't know yet. No. Would you, if 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 Zagallo was to talk to Brian Robson and say, Juninho is is certain of playing for Brazil in France in the World Cup, um, irrespective of whether he's in Premiership or First Division, would you still like to stay? <laughs> That's, uh, Zagallo can say that to, can say that. No, he can say that to, to Brian. So in Brazil, um, every month come come a new player. So you have to to be fit. You have to play well all the games to 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 keep in the Brazil squad. So it's very difficult to Zagallo uh, watch me in the in the first division. We have had something come back on the internet. Somebody spoken to Zagallo and said, he, you are certainly in his plans, firmly in his plans for World Cup 90. That's true, that's true. That came from Sao Paulo to, so. to here. So. Yeah. Does that please you? When, despite all what's happening, Middlesbrough have been relegated, but still to have news like that coming from Brazil, does, yeah, that, does that make yeah, you happy? Yeah, yeah. make me happy, yeah. Is that, it's very important for me, playing the national team. It's the most important for me in, in my career in the moment. To wear number 10? Yeah, yeah. Or oh, number ten, number seven, whatever. You wear, <laughs> because you have won nine, haven't you, for Brazil? Mm -hmm. Nine, and I played with seven too. Mm. Would you like ten on because of Zico and Pele? Yeah. If I play, it's no mind. No let's, mind the number. Let's bring Higgy into this. Now I'm not going to ask you if you want to play for Brazil. Janinho <laughs> 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 says, you know, he's, he's, you're a good friend of his. 
Would it be sad for you as an individual to see somebody like Junie leave? Right, of course it was. I mean, it, not just because of his skills and his talent on the pitch, but because he's a little character as well. You know, he's, uh, he's fantastic to have around the dressing room. He's picked English up brilliant. I know he, he's tried it 100% in every game he's played. Um, but he's a little character. He's a lot funnier than what he looks now. <laughs> Tell us about that tie for the Coca-Cola final. The tie? The tie you wore with the suit. You didn't like it, did you? No, it was a terrible tie. <laughs> yeah, but you see his dress sense is, is minging anyway, isn't it? You're bad dresser. He, 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 his clothes is very bad. Very bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes with the yellow tie and uh, dark, dark blue. You not like yellow? Suit. Huh? Do you not like yellow? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you, I like yellow. When he wears You shirt. don't like yellow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she so what's, yellow, what's yeah. wrong with Higgy's dress sense? Why, 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 why is he not a good dresser? I've got mm. Bernie slagging me off here. I've got you slagging me here. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy having a go at your dress sense. I don't mind. You can have a go. No, Come on, Mongo. Sometimes he, he mix the, the colour that's... It's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. terrible. Tell us about him as a player. I mean, what, what, what do you see when you're out he's, there on the he's pitch? Different. He's different from anything we've got in England because... He's, he's got a little bit of everything. He's, you know, he, he runs all day. He runs at people with the ball. He, he's probably the best dribbler I've ever seen. In fact, he is the best dribbler I've ever seen. Uh, and his phone goes off constantly. <laughs> is that your phone? That's not my phone. <laughs> 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 that's not my phone. Yeah, so, I mean, and this year, he, he scored a lot of goals as well. So you put that all together and you, you've got him. Well, tell us about the free kick on the video. The free kick on the video is a good free kick. Yeah, it was a good. Yeah, it was my free kick. Sorry, it was my free kick. I hit the free kick. Hang on, I hit the free kick. And they filmed my free kick, and then they must have filmed him taking another one, and you know they put it on it. It was his. He always robs my stuff. I can't believe it. So was that not your free kick? Yeah, it was my. Yeah, Iggy was training. Iggy was training with me. So say it without smiling. Yeah, say to him the. Say it without smiling about our competition. Who, who is scored more goals uh, in the free kicks? Which oh. competition are you on about? We'll watch, we'll watch Tolsby? Let's Dance very shortly, yeah, but let's, yeah. let's delve deeper into this. Um, um, Tolsby Road, he beat me up. What score was it? Free kicks? <laughs> four. No. More, more Eight, than four. seven. Well, so what is it? You have a little well, competition. I, 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 I won. You won. We had a competition yeah. taking free kicks, right? Yeah. So he scored eight, I scored seven. So he won. He gets to take the first free kick on a Saturday if we get one. So what about the competition out here the other day? We had ten free kicks, oh, and I beat you 3-1. <laughs> oh, Football players, who'd be one? Who'd be one? Let's dance. Oh, yeah. Ward considers at a deduction of three points is right and fair. Did you? Jorginho's a lot better. Tell us why. Better dribbler. Better ball player. Yeah, I'm sure you <laughs> keep. <laughs> Saying is the key to it tomorrow at Wembley. Do you agree with that or not? I do agree, very much so. Very what do you think so. of him as a player? Outstanding. Probably the best player in the league, without a doubt. It sounds like a cliche, but Janino is the heart of the team. He's the man. He's going to be the key tomorrow. He's going to win it tomorrow, no problem. <laughs> Bit of a 
a silly question to ask uh, who the favourite player is. No. Who is this? Janino. All the, all the girls love Janino, don't they? All the women love Ravinelli. <laughs> And girls, why why don't you want Janino to go? Because he's class. excellent. He's class, he's excellent, isn't he? Yeah, he's the best player in the world. going on about Janino trying his socks off, did you see it that way? Oh yeah, Janino's a magic man, he's one of these people who will always, um, doesn't matter what club he, he plays for, he plays for Middlesbrough, he plays for Manchester United or he plays for Brazil, he will always put his heart into football because he's a football man and he is a star on his own isn't he, you know, uh, you can't take it away from Janino, he is a class of his own, he's a magic man. I think he's been the one player who's been outstanding for us and he tries 150% and um, I don't think Middlesbrough, I think the Middlesbrough owe him more, well they certainly don't owe any of the other players this but I think they owe it to him um, to make sure that his career remains intact and I think that means that he's going to have to go at the end of the season, well go now I think. As Borough's beaten Wembley heroes paid their tribute to the supporters, Juninho was already planning his future away from Seaside. Uh, no matter what happens, we need a team here next season that was better than the one we had last season. And that's what we always try to do and that's what Brian's uh, started working on already. Six days earlier, Janino was at the Riverside for the Selnet Player of the Year Awards. Deep down, some Borough fans knew they were saying goodbye to their hero. to move Emerson. He started it, he helped it on his way, and he finished it. 52 minutes gone, it's Middlesbrough 1, Chelsea 0. Oh, that's going to go down as one of the goals of the season, and it came from Janino. Janino, please welcome us to the stand. Janino! 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 I'm not quite surprised 
because they score so many goals with me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how are you legs? Are you tired yet? You've been running all season. Sorry? Are you tired yet? You've been running all season. Yeah, 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 yeah a little bit tired. <laughs> Once again. I can't talk to the guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for an example of his performance against Newcastle, Janinho. <laughs> you don't want to talk to me again, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. You happy, yeah? No, you... You're joking, huh? <laughs> you don't see uh, so many skills in the English football, so more in the, more in the South America. So more, yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. Uh, it's more and more physical games. So when heavy uh, uh, players like McManaman, the Fowler, Ignat. That it's good to see, good to watch. So, congratulations for all, all that's played. I think the whole country enjoyed watching you this season. Congratulations. <laughs> Everybody absolutely loves you here. I'm very glad to uh, to win this this job, and I had a great season here uh, with my my teammates. And I'm very disappointed yesterday with the with the result because uh, um, I came here to always I said that but I came here to win to help me to grow in something and to stay in the, in the Premier League. So I never, I never I thought uh, that Middlesbrough could be down. So I'm, I'm very disappointed, I'm very upset. But uh, uh, we had the good moments and bad moments this, this season. And uh, I can't believe that 
our team, uh, the team like Middlesbrough, that the, the players that they have here uh, play in the, in the first division next year. So we are so good to play in the first division. Um, but the, it's a football, it's a life. Um, I hope Middlesbrough can, can get up, up again uh, next season. But perhaps you have the best moment of all next Saturday. Huh? Perhaps the best moment of all this coming Saturday. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah but uh, I think the, for this club, uh, it's a very important game Saturday, of course. But uh, it's most important the ones they stay in the Premier. So that's that's gone, and we have to think now in the in the next game Saturday. Because we, we had a great season and Saturday we have a chance to prove uh, in the pit that we, we are very good team, we are a uh, better team than a lot that stay in the, in the Premier League. Yeah. <laughs> to the vast majority of Middlesbrough fans, Giannino was simply the best. The greatest player ever to wear the Red Bull shirt a shirt he wore with great skill, great pride and great passion. Borough fans worshipped him, rival fans feared him, but everyone loved his incredible skill. Good luck, Janino, in your ambition to become the best in the world. On behalf of every one of your fans back in England, thanks for the memory. Oh, well, he's, he's just the best. He's brilliant. I, mean, he's, I think he's better than all of us, like Henderson and all of them. So I just think he's brilliant. The best player I've ever seen in Wilbur. Since I came here, I had the, had a lot of support here, and I love this, I love this area here, and I, I will miss a lot Middlesbrough, but I, I will still support Middlesbrough uh, wherever I go. But it's a good move for you professionally. Prof professionally, I think is uh, the best that I, I, I see in the moment. And it was always going to be Atletico Madrid, wasn't it? In your mind, that was the club you wanted to go to. Sorry. Atletico Madrid was always the club you wanted. Yeah, Atletico Madrid since uh, when was two or three months ago. Atletico shows the, the interest, and I spoke to to the manager two or three times, and I stay happy with the the ambition. So, and they are a big club in Spain, and they. The Spanish league shows every weekend in Brazil, so that I will be more more next to the Brazil reporters. Juninho, can you believe the support from the Middlesbrough fans here today for a player who's leaving the club? <laughs> uh, I'm uh, I'm not surprised with the support. They they <laughs> they have conditions to do everything. That uh, but uh, I'm I'm a little bit upset with the supports and uh, I had the, uh, very good emotions here, but I will support Middlesbrough. I hope that Middlesbrough uh, can go to Premier League in the next year too. So I, uh, I live here and a lot of friends. Uh, I made a lot of friends here, so I will miss Middlesbrough. Do you think you'd like to return to play in the Premiership one day? One day, yeah. Uh, I love to play in England. Uh, I like a lot the, the people here, uh, the league, that uh, is very good to play in England. And if you have your opportunity in the future, I hope you come back. It's a £12 million transfer fee. We have first option to buy him back. And uh, we've also contracted to play two friendly games with Atletico Madrid at the Riverside Stadium, at which Juninho is guaranteed to play. First option to buy him back when his contract finishes, when might that be? How long have they bought him for? It's his first option to buy him back whenever he chooses to leave Atletico Madrid. Let's hope we see him back on Teesside. You're happy with the £12 million fee? It seems to take an awful lot of time to dot the I's and cross the T's there. Uh, a, little, a little bit of time, yeah. But I, I'm happy with the fee, but I'd rather have kept Janino. It's a sad day for us, really. A sad day for the fans, but they've turned out in force. Absolutely stupendous. I said earlier that some, some players don't get this many fans here when they sign for a club, but uh, we've got him here for uh, Janino's departure. He's, uh, he's very emotionally uh, uh, upset by it.
When Match of the Day first visited Ayrson Park in the black and white days of the late 60s, Middlesbrough and Stan Anderson were in the second division promotion pack. They finished sixth, fourth, fourth again and seventh in four consecutive seasons. They had a prolific goal scorer in John Hickton, who was Borough's top marksman for six years running. And he had a lively partner in Hugh McElmoyle. Downing going for the return, but Williams there. Setting a nice dummy to McElmoyle as well. John Manning. Bit of a flick there by Bill Gates. Charlie Hardy getting his side into trouble. And the opening goal of the match comes from John Hickton. With only 45 seconds gone. What a terrible return for Charlie Hurley, coming back to the northeast after having 11 years with Sunderland, and he presents John Hickton with a goal for Middlesbrough after only 45 seconds of the match. McMordy trying to tee it up, trying to do a Rodney Marsh there, didn't quite come off. McAwhite underneath it again. Hickton acting as decoy, Gates gets up, Gates up again, Hickton! What a goal! So simple that it almost couldn't be true, but it was. McAmore! And Hopkinson coming out of protest and with every justification. The defensive header was missed, and McAmore just had to nod. 4 0 to Middlesbrough there. For six seasons under Anderson, Borough never finished lower than ninth in the second division. But promotion eluded them, despite Hickton's masterful finishing. This is Mills. Good looking ball, Hickton! Meeting the ball first time and poor, poor Cooper didn't have much chance with that. Played forward by Page to Latchford. Hatton moving on the right. He's got across Dragon. In the post, Francis. A young Trevor Francis went up with Birmingham, but when Middlesbrough missed out yet again, Stan Anderson gave way to Jack Charlton fresh from a distinguished playing career with Leeds in England. Charlton's arrival marked the start of the most successful period in Middlesbrough's modern history. He made an immediate impact with his bluff personality, his cute understanding of the game and his uncomplicated playing style. T's side soon adopted the angular Tynesider, whose first season at Ayrson Park threatened to break all second division records as Borough stormed to the championship. They took over at the top in October and stayed there for the rest of the season, ensuring promotion halfway through March and clinching the title with eight games still to play. Borough achieved their highest ever points total of 65, their longest unbeaten league run of 24 games, their best defensive record with only 30 goals against. And with Bobby Murdoch in midfield, their most influential player and the only one signed by Charlton, they won the second division championship by a record margin of 15 points. All this made Charlton manager of the year in his first season. David Mills and the other players he inherited all improved under his coaching methods and motivation. Other names in that championship side included Graham Souness, Stuart Bohm, Willie Madron, Jim Platt, David Armstrong and John Craggs. Armstrong, the player behind Craggs. Oh, and it deflected off the wall. So the goal will go down to Johnny Craigs and it came off the wall past the goalkeeper who had moved the other way. Johnny Craigs, third goal of the season, through the wall, deflecting the ball the opposite way, the one which the goalkeeper had moved to. Nickel. Ross. Little, Riach, Ross Wright, 
Braden. Rioch. Left foot this time. Bruce Riott would later manage Middlesbrough, but for now, it was the affable Sergeant Major Charlton who was cracking the whip. Jack put fitness high on his list of priorities as Middlesbrough prepared for their return to the First Division after 20 years. Come on, Jim, you'll catch him if you rush. It's only got about 10 minutes and you're finished. In Charlton's terms, Middlesbrough were only just starting. They weren't joining the big league just to make up the numbers. They had a team spirit and a playing pattern that would stand them in good stead. Come on, the last two you're on now. You two to do. Borough lost only three of their first 14 games and at one stage were third in the first division. Charlton's team were hard to beat and they eventually finished seventh. Playing with so much confidence, Alan Hudson. Now Mahoney. Hudson again. Appeal against both the handball is given. Penalty. Number five phoned the offender and the referee had no doubt at all. Hudson was involved in the move twice. And Mills being persuaded not to protest because the referee's already booked two Middlesbrough players. And it's down to Jim Platt now to try to stop the penalty. John Ritchie to take it. And as the referee ran back to the centre, one or two protests followed him from Middlesbrough players. But Ritchie gives Stoke the lead. Armstrong's got Hickson going to his right, number nine. Sooners to murder. That's for Craggs who got well forward. Mills. Sooners. Oh, beautiful shot by Graham Sooners. Just what Middlesbrough wanted an immediate reply. John Craggs, the fullback, had got well forward as he tends to do, had a hand in the move. The ball came back to Sooness. And what a beautiful shot, beating Farmer right in the corner. You've got to be brave enough, Bob, and you, speak to put the ball into them positions. Wade, when there's nobody there, because he's going to get there. But you've got to go square on these things. Attack the near post when the ball's in short for Willie's run. But ball goes to Willie if he's free. In that same season, Borough equaled their best ever performance in the FA Cup. Hello. Saunas has given it a curve. What a mistake. Well saved. Bronson scores. Sunderland going to the lead after 10 minutes of play. Craggs. That could have been dangerous too. Spraggan coming forward for Middlesbrough. Mills comes to Saunas. Saunas a lovely ball. Murdoch. Dragon to Craggs. Mills taken down. It must be a penalty. Mills taken down by Trevor Swinburne. The ball had bounced very well for him. It looked suspiciously like offside, but he did get through. And when he got through, Trevor Swinburne took him down. So it's still Mills who's been causing all the problems. And now. A penalty for Middlesbrough. Hickton. Just makes it 2-1, only just. Swim 
Van read it right. He got his hand to it, but the force of the shot took it over the line. That's Murdoch. Good ball. They were in their own half. It's Mills. David Mills has got the chance. He's taken down again. Is it another penalty? It is. has given it he checked with his linesman another one penalty number two for Hickton goal number three for Middlesbrough the score Middlesbrough three Sunderland one that meant a place in the fifth round twice beating Hickton Peter were playing some good stuff here's Robson that's useful, Gregory, it's coming to Nixon, must be! <laughs> Fifteen minutes gone, and the good stuff that Peterborough had been showing, rewarded. Boggan, John Michael in two minds, and it's in! Borough won the replay to reach the sixth round, the furthest they'd ever been in the FA Cup. Hatton right up on the line. Gannaker at the back. And Hatton scored! What a start to the second half! If you caught the expression of Howard Kendall at the start of that half, slightly on the side of his head and Bob Hatton opens the scoring but the following season Middlesbrough did lay their hands on a senior trophy at last they reached the final of the Anglo-Scottish Cup and the first leg against FA Cup finalist Fulham was at Ayrson Park Armstrong, Madron comes to Hickton number 10 that was a fine ball from Murdoch to Cooper. It was a brilliant ball. Cooper's cross and strong into his own net. That was the only goal of the first leg. So a nil-nil draw at Craven Cottage gave the cup to Middlesbrough. With the minimum of outlay, Charlton had given Teesside a team to be proud of and one that was hard to beat. Strong, collected that well. Mills is just to his right, wanting the through ball. Here's Mills. Takes on Merrick and gets round him and goes down. And the referee has given a penalty kick. So Middlesbrough's chance to score what will be only their 11th goal of the season in the league. And David Armstrong steps forward. And scores quite easily. It's a matter of some importance to City to try and get this goal back as soon as they can. If they can just put pressure on Middlesbrough in the early minutes of this half before it really settles, they might save themselves a more difficult job later on. Garland got up well. It came to job Armstrong looking for Mills and Middlesbrough for all that said about them are pushing forward again now good run by Mills Wood is just behind and it's in the back of the net by Bride but that 1976-77 season was to be the last at Ayrson Park for Jack Charlton an independent figure to say the least he decided to leave You've got to go beyond people into that area. You've got to get the hardest ball in the world for a defender to head. It's one when he's going back. Charlton went back into management with Sheffield Wednesday and later with the Republic of Ireland. But he said his only regret in football was leaving Middlesbrough too soon. The new man at Ayrson Park was Durham-born John Neal, who wasn't slow to dismantle Charlton's team and build his own. Hunter again. 
This is Tainton for Bristol. Again, Royal is the target. That was Mabbott. It's going to come to Jerry Gow. Oh, a good goal. That was really well taken. And Jerry Gow puts some life back into the match now and into Bristol City. There's Armstrong. And Armstrong again. He went nicely for that and scored. Oh, that's well taken as well by David Armstrong. When Match of the Day switched to Sunday in 1980, Burrow was centre stage. Good afternoon and welcome to this week's programme which has the salty flavour of the North East about it. Country where the memories of players such as Milburn, Shackleton, Mannion and the like will still be part of the folklore in a hundred years time. Our main match comes from Ayrson Park where Middlesbrough played Norwich City and it's sensational. The team news is that Middlesbrough make two changes. Jim Flatt returns in goal after injury and with Terry Cochran still unfit David Shearer replaces Irving Natras as Borough revert to a 4-3-3 formation. Billy Ashcroft fit enough only to be substitute, so 19-year-old Mike Angus continues at centre-half. Here's Angus. That's Shearer. Interchange with Hodgson. Simons with the defender, who was finally penalised. Johnston up, and Armstrong's in there, saved by the goalkeeper's feet, back by McAndrew, and in! And on his 200th first team appearance, the captain scores. Coming from a free kick by John Craggs, Armstrong's first effort hitting the goalkeeper, Hansbury, and Tony McAndrew heading through to put Middlesbrough into the lead after seven minutes. McAndrew. Hodgson is out wide, it's a good ball. Johnston coming in, and so now is McAndrew. And he's hit the post, and Bond got the ball away. Well, Tony McAndrew is making this almost a virtuoso performance. He scored one, and he hit that beautifully through a crowd of players. And it came back off the post, and Kevin Bond scooped it away. Jankovic and Middlesbrough have got three players coming from the back now and one of them is Angus the centre half on the far post here oh and Hansbrough's missed it Jankovic poor Roger Hansbrough he knows that's his fault Hodgson started that with a good run down the centre he found Jankovic out on the right the cross looked too long, but Mike Angus beat Kevin Bond to it. And when his cross came back in, poor Roger Hansbury made a terrible mess of it. And Bosco Jankovic made it 2-0 with 31 minutes gone. There goes Jankovic, and the goalkeeper's committed himself rashly here. They're queuing up in the middle. And out from underneath the crossbar, Johnston's in there. Here's Armstrong, and a turn by, oh, and Johnston goes in on Hansbury. It was McAndrew in your picture who had that last shot, incidentally. And as he did so, Johnston went in to challenge Roger Hansbury, and the Middlesbrough player got the worst of it. 
Middlesbrough, who start the second half, have been the one North East club to provide First Division football consistently over the last six years. And John Neal certainly got a good young side here. This is Armstrong, only 25 still himself. He's through. Played it inside to Jankovic. Well, Bosco Jankovic needs only one goal now to beat his total for the whole of last season because as Armstrong threaded his way through there, Jankovic turned and shot just wide, but uh, Bosco's goal today is his third of this season and three was his total for the whole of last. Dropped his header. Then Powell, then Armstrong, then Shearer. Oh, and nicely done again by Middlesbrough. Here's Armstrong, and he's got Jankovic in here. And Hansborough makes a good stop. Just got his left hand to it. Beautifully set up by little Armstrong. He put Jankovic in. Jankovic took it early, and the goalkeeper made a good save. certainly Armstrong's corner and it went through a whole crowd of players to finish up in the net Johnston Armstrong McAndrew Hodgson he's got one to beat good tackle but Hodgson so quick to win it back driven in and Bosco Jankovic at the far post and Middlesbrough could be on to a hat pull here they really could They've missed so many chances and torn the Norwich defence apart so often and so completely with crosses like that. That's Jankovic. Oh, and Armstrong was coming. Armstrong! Oh! Well, that could have gone anywhere. And Hansbury just scooping it out from David Armstrong. Johnston. Shaking them off nicely. Proctor's in there with a the header. Oh, he's put it over the bar. Well, they've missed some really good chances of Middlesbrough. Good cross by Craig Johnston, and Mark Proctor really should have put that in. His header was just too high. Proctor. Right on the left is Ian Bailey. Again. It's been given away again. Bailey's still in there fighting for it in the corner finally. McAndrew and a corner again. Hodgson's flick. Oh, and it's gone in off Woods, I think. Hodgson certainly got the first touch for Middlesbrough. But I think it may well have gone in off Clive Woods. The corner curled into the near post, a back header by Hodgson, deflection in, and it's 4-0. his 10th goal of the season mistake by McAndrew who just completely misjudged it and let Fashionu through and within a minute Norwich get one back inside it goes here's Johnston oh, saved by Hansbury tipped it over 
really cracked that Craig Johnston and Hansbury did well to turn it over coach John Coddington must be delighted hooked away by Simons Angus Craggs Proctor Craggs again is he offside Jankovic no he's not now then can Jankovic do it here he can thumped it in with 10 minutes to go, Bosco Jankovic scores again. And once more, Norwich, a man short at the back. The ball played at the right time, putting Jankovic through. And this time he's finishing absolutely on target. And the referee brings to an end one of the more memorable afternoons at Ayrson Park. And John Neal shakes hands with John Bond because his side have proved that he's got a team here who do know how to attack and do know how to put the ball away. A day that Bosco Jankovic will remember, but a day when the whole Middlesbrough side played with flair and freedom, and that's one of the old-fashioned football scores, isn't it, when games used to be like that more often. Middlesbrough 6, Norwich City 1. When Middlesbrough opened their FA Cup campaign at Swansea the following January, two of their key forwards, Craig Johnston and David Armstrong, were out injured and watched from the stand. They saw Borough inflict another massacre. That's it, Curtis has been that way so often and back again. James. Again an awkward ball, Charles, right down to the goalkeeper and he got into the second attempt. Jeremy Charles came zooming in on that, hung in the air, knocked it down, and the goalkeeper, Jim Platt, had a second grab before he got it. So it's Mark Proctor with the corner. Ashcroft got a touch. Well, it came awkwardly loose for a moment then. Ashcroft got the touch, and Tony McAndrew almost got a foot in Ashcroft and he's put it there this time and it's a goal the ball crossed from Cochrane and really while Swansea were thinking they'd escape then they seemed to pause the whole defence seemed to freeze the ball knocked back into the uh, box and there was Ashcroft the striker turned stopper reverts to his goal scoring habit and right against the run of play in the 42nd minute puts the first division side in front Shearer to McAndrew, actually hard in, but McAndrew is strong enough. Oh, he found Hodgson so well, can he turn on Rushbury? On to number four, Angus, and it's 2-0! A real blockbuster! McAndrew won the ball, played a beautiful ball through to Hodgson. Hodgson turned, measured the pass to Angus, and the young midfield defender came tearing through to tank it home. Robbie James. Atley flicked on to Curtis. Oh, and there's Giles, his first touch. First touch in the game, and it's the story of the first half again. 45 seconds gone in this uh, second half, just the start like the first half, and Swansea have missed yet another chance. Well, it's very awkward for a player when he comes on like that. He's not really heated up to the pace of the game, but the chance was there and should be taken. Phillips. James tried to lay it on for Robinson. And James couldn't get there because of the referee. Proctor missed kicked him. The ball is bobbling and bouncing and chattering on this pitch. A lot of bad breaks. Giles. 
corner. Certainly with the wind and the uneven pitch, it really is uh, rippling a couple of occasions when they pass it, chattering over the uneven ground, the players having problems. Oh, kicked off the line, Stevenson got it there, the defender was on the line. It was Stevenson's header, but the defender knocked it straight back. It was straight at him, the reflex was there, and it's out again. Now Rushbury. And number 12, Giles offside. And the referee, Joe Worrell, absolutely in line with play, and there will be few quarrels with that. Swansea look disappointed, but they're not arguing. by Angus, but this is Rushbury. Hodgson, he's wide and he's got an empty goal, and he's there, 3-0. The man who's caused so much trouble throughout this match, and he surely now puts it beyond Swansea's reach. Hodgson battling away up front, he really has been a thorn in this uh, Swansea defence. He's fought for everything, he's shown skill and speed, and there he showed finishing ability. Well, it will be an enjoyable trip back to the northeast tonight. Middlesbrough not one away from home this season, but in this important FA Cup tie, they seem to be on the way now, and well on the way. 3-0 in front. Watch. Oh, what a spectacular effort, and it's there! Terry Cochran scores one of the most spectacular goals of the season. He goes across the middle for his supporters to celebrate, and no wonder. There was absolutely nothing on there. The ball just bobbing around. It was loose to Cochran. He speculated, and they accumulate as well. 4-0 now, two goals in a minute. It's such an incredible contradiction of the way the game has gone. James. Atley. Phillips. Giles. Swansea trying to play a lot of these one twos in the box and they're not working. Now they've got problems there. Swansea three against two. Proctor through to Hodgson and it's number five. Ten minutes left and yet another breakaway. Split Swansea wide open. Middlesbrough had a spare attacker there, and when Proctor got clear, he made no mistake with the pass through to Hodgson, and Hodgson kept his head and found himself eventually with an empty net. Terry, do you score many like that? No, they just come once in a while. Very special. Now, when you uh, got the ball, it broke loose. Were you aware of the sort of geography of what? Well, the ball was knocked to the far end of the uh, six-yard box and I got into the middle, so I knew it was somewhere near the goals, especially in the middle. So instead of trying to turn on it, I just tried an overhead kick, which I'd, I do these wee things in training, you know, sometimes they come off and sometimes they don't, but it came off on the day. It started a cup run that once again saw Middlesbrough progress to the quarter-final, that perpetual hurdle. Against Wolves at Ayrson Park, Cochrane figured again. The call's on the near post. That's where it went, and it's going to come to Jeff Palmer with the shot. He hit his own play on the call. Here's Eves. And there's Gray. And it's there. And Andy Gray responds to the demands made by John Barber and Richie Barker and scores after eight minutes. Jankovic. Cochran. But Burra lost the replay and collapsed against champions elect Aston Villa. Evans gets up, there's with. There's Evans, couldn't Shaw! Gary Shaw! And Morley from McNaught. Cowens. Proctor chasing him back. Morley available again. With! 
Ken McNaught up with Platt Evans. John Neal had had enough. It was hard for Middlesbrough to hang on to star players. And his successor, Bobby Murdoch, inherited a team shorn of the likes of Craig Johnston, David Armstrong and Mark Proctor, all sold for big fees. Without them, Borough faced relegation. Pickering, Munro, Raoul. Buckley. Time Sunderland building quite nicely. Here's McCoy, that's a tough ball. Buckley! Good save by Platt. And good play by Bailey. The deserved applause for a nicely built attack. And not for the first time in the match, it was Buckley who got in there at the end. And Platt coming to meet him, parried to good purpose. And here's Hodgson, who just kept on side. Got Ashcock up to help. Bit of a dive in by Hindmarch, and it's gone in of the combination of Ashcroft and Munro. Ashcroft will claim the credit, there's no doubt about that. 34 minutes gone, and Middlesbrough take the lead, and they've had more than one break in the match before, and that one was one of some pace. Hudson just staying onside running down the left side, Hindmarch really diving in with the tackle, the ball pulled across, Munro going with Ashcroft and the ball in the net. Thomas. And it backs the shot. Seem to get a deflection. And Middlesbrough get the second goal. But to no avail, Middlesbrough went back to the second division after eight years in the first. A boardroom revolution installed Malcolm Allison as manager, and there were hopes of a revival at Ayrson Park. Hankin, forward for Bell. Beautiful taken by Bell. So he's the hero for the second Saturday running. Well, I must say, it was the delightful ball that was played to him by Ray Hankin. He's gone to look for Hankin, I'm sure. There he was. Just mobbed through. And Bell, with great confidence, placing it away from Bob Boulder to get the home side the lead. A solid display, his Baxter. But suddenly, out of nothing, Pearson scores. And really, they went to sleep from the throw-in. Shelton who turned it on, and Pearson finally ends a long drought to equalise at one all. In 1984, Allison steered Borough to a famous FA Cup victory over Arsenal, and one of their scorers, Paul Segru, netted twice in this fourth round tie against Bournemouth. But Borough lost at Notts County in the fifth round, and by March, Allison had gone. Jack Charlton returned until the end of the season, and then the popular Willie Madron took over as manager. But Middlesbrough were in decline. They only escaped relegation in 1985 by winning at Shrewsbury on the last day of the season. And here, they went out of the FA Cup to 4th Division Darlington in a third round replay. The demise of what had been a respectable 1st Division club had spread to the supporters. Crowds at Ayrson Park slumped to 4,000 and the following season, Borough slid into the third division, where they had spent one season in the 60s. Even the return of local favourite Tony McAndrew, who scored a consolation goal at Darlington, couldn't stop the misery. And neither at first could the new manager, Bruce Rioch, who discovered in the summer of 1986 just how bad things were off the field. Middlesbrough were bankrupt. The official receiver moved in, the stuff moved out, the gates at Ayrson Park were padlocked. But Rioch refused to give up. His players continued to train elsewhere and started their third division programme by borrowing Hartlepool's ground. 
With debts of £2 million, the club went 90 minutes past a deadline set for closure before being saved by the intervention of the local authority and Northeastern business. On the field, a rejuvenated Archie Stevens scored twice as Middlesbrough drew 2-2 with Port Vale and began a run of six games without defeat that has put them top of the third division. The gates were eventually unlocked by new chairman Colin Henderson three days after the start of the season. And the dark days of summer will remain a painful memory for manager Bruce Rioch. The training was going very, very well from July 17th onwards until the time that we weren't able to gain access to Ayrson Park and their own training grounds. And uh, we were short of material, materials and facilities and we moved from one ground to another. We, we, I mean, we had great help from the local people, but uh, we didn't actually have a base. And, uh, and of course, the nearer the issue went to the start of the season and the doubts that the football club may not exist, then obviously the more doubts that we had uh, from the players. Um, yeah, the gates were locked on July the 30th, and uh, Bruce and myself, and especially Bruce, has kept, he kept the club afloat. He's done superb, Bruce. And the players have kept in, we've stuck together. And uh, we're getting the results for it now. But I must admit, if it hadn't have been for Bruce, I don't think the cl club would have survived. Coming to the ground, and we wouldn't know where we were training on the particular morning, and we'd have to go to local colleges, school fields even to train. And it was like one bag of balls, no equipment or nothing, no bibs. It was more or less like, like it was at school. You take your coats off and throw them down and make a five-a-side pitch. But um, it was great from the coaching staff, the manager, that he kept things going and um, morale was kept pretty high. That 66 World Cup goal is the most famous remembered by the Essen Park footballing public who today are supporting the club's revival by returning in double the numbers of last season, despite local unemployment. We're going on the right way, we're getting crowds of 7,000 now, whereas last year we were just getting crowds of four. So it just shows you, if you're successful on, on the field of play, we will get the public coming back on us. Borough won promotion as third division runners-up. And the following season, despite an FA Cup scare here against Sutton United, who finally succumbed in extra time at Ayrson Park to a Paul Kerr goal, Middlesbrough finished third in Division 2 and qualified for the playoffs. They had already shown what they could do against First Division opposition when they took Everton to three matches in the fourth round of the FA Cup. By now, players like hard-tackling Dean Glover, high-scoring Bernie Slaven and Pacey Stuart Ripley, who scored here and played regularly for England under-21s, were attracting rave reviews. Although Everton scraped through here, Borough were back in the land of the living. Ayrson Park had witnessed two remarkable years born out of acute adversity. Crowds that had dropped to 4,000 now averaged four times that figure and well over 20,000 packed the stadium for two second division matches. It marked the rebirth of a club steeped in tradition, and former heroes like the incomparable Wilf Mannion were among those who watched with admiration as Bruce Rioch turned what was a lost cause into a going concern. Well, they were practically finished, as you say, but uh, I think uh, Rioch's done a marvellous job. Uh, He's lifted them up by the bootstrings and he's concentrating on local talent and uh, he's built up a, a very good side. Also, you can see the discipline in the side. He's a very good manager and they've got some very good players. One of them was Gary Pallister, picked for England and transferred to Manchester United for £2.3 million. His defensive partner, Tony Mowbray, was Borough's Captain Fantastic, a born leader who epitomised the Rioch revival. Until you lose a football club from your community, you don't realise um, the problems that it can cause. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day here, not just at Middlesbrough, but at all clubs across the country, a successful football club lifts the enthusiasm of the community. Those people that follow football uh, intensely, or those people that follow football on the peripheral, uh, 
they get a big kick out of their, their side doing, doing well for the town. And uh, I mean, you have to ask the Accrington Stanleys and the Southports, whose teams went out of uh, existence, how, how difficult it can be. It was difficult for Middlesbrough to beat Bradford City in the semi-final of the playoffs. But now, the first leg of the final against Chelsea. Now oh, Middlesbrough need a good cross. Give a senior, got a header to it! Trevor Senior, but definitely a mix-up in the Chelsea defence. Oh, well waved on by Keith Hackett. Oh, that's a good ball out by Senior. Slavin's completely unmarked and he can go well forward into the penalty area. And can he pick somebody out? He got it the second time. Bernie Slavin gives Middlesbrough what could be an absolutely crucial second goal. Slavin's 24th goal of the season put Borough in good heart for the second leg at Stamford Bridge. May the 28th, 1988, proved a momentous day in Middlesbrough history. Tony Mowbray led out a team just 90 minutes away from the first division, less than two years after the club had virtually ceased to exist. Fury with the throw for Chelsea. Nick uh, Nevin against the post. Ripley made himself a yard but didn't seem to appreciate it. And against the post, and then over the top from Slaven. So, both goals escape courtesy of the woodwork in the opening minutes of the game. Ripley held on, and the chip was just over the keeper's fingers, off the post, and then over the top with the goal gaping from Slaven. Clocking. Glover. Monster's little pass through, Dixon's touch. And Wilson to Nevin. Nevin's chip. Dury! That has opened it up. Now we really have got a playoff on our hands. Fifteen minutes to go. But it's a tightrope Middlesbrough walking. One slip. That's all it needs. Equally true, of course, of Chelsea. They uh, only need to have a moment of casualness in their defence. And another goal for Middlesbrough would surely settle it. But it doesn't look too likely at the moment. It's Chelsea again through Nevin. Curled one. Bears saw it all the way. Bruce Rioch counting the seconds. Moistening the lips. I doubt whether anything he experienced as a player is as tense as what he's been through this afternoon. The mistake now would be barely forgivable. Slaven. And there's the whistle. Middlesbrough have lost 1-0, but they win 2-1 on aggregate. They head for the first division and Chelsea go back to the second. The goal by Gordon Dury was not enough for Chelsea. The goals that Trevor Senior and Bernie Slaven scored at Ayrson Park on Wednesday night have done the trick and Middlesbrough's marvellous rise from the brink of insolvency to the first division in two seasons is complete. Steve Pears, Dean Glover, Colin Cooper, Tony Mowbray, Gary Parkinson, Gary Pallister, Bernie Slaven, Gary Hamilton, Paul Kerr, Stuart Ripley, Alan Kernigan, Brian Laws, Mark Burke and Trevor Senior. 
These were the heroes who Borough fans saluted after their second successive promotion. Players who in turn acknowledged the contribution of the Teesside contingent in the 40,000 crowd on that summer Saturday in 1988. It was just six years since Middlesbrough had left the first division, but there were times in the dark days of 1986 when their very survival looked unlikely. Giants like Tony Mowbray had made the dream come true. Come the following season, life returned to normal. Borough made a sound enough start in the first division. They had a run of six wins in nine games early in the season. But despite the regular supply of goals from Bernie Slaven, they had perhaps come too far too quickly. Expectancy was high among crowds of 20,000 at Ayrson Park. But an FA Cup defeat there by 4th Division Grimsby was a prelude to a disastrous run in the second half of the season. From the middle of January, Borough won only one of 17 First Division games. They had to beat Sheffield Wednesday at Hillsborough on the last day of the season in order to survive an immediate return to the Second Division. Weakened by the absence through injury of key players, Middlesbrough lost 1-0 and went down. They only just stayed in the second division in 1990. Rioc was still in charge for this FA Cup replay at Everton, but in March he was replaced by his assistant Colin Todd, who therefore led Borough out on their first ever visit to Wembley, where they lost to Chelsea in the Zenith Cup final. Again, the relegation battle went to the last day of the season, but this time Middlesbrough beat Newcastle 4-1 and stayed in Division 2. With Todd confirmed as manager and defiant gestures like the one coming up here from Gary Parkinson, Borough once again fell back on the club's undying spirit to lift them towards a place in the playoffs in 1991. The match of the day years have twice seen Middlesbrough rise from the third division to the first and soon they will proudly rub shoulders with the top brass again.
bit of agony for him. Can he hang on out there? He's still going all the way. He's got his head down. He's just de so determined, isn't he, to win? What a determination that man's got. And this big bunch behind him, now caught up with Ekimov, just shows the speed at which uh, Durand is going. Can he make it, Stephen? They were putting the earth into sacks and Jason was taking them off somewhere to dump. I guessed why. My nightmare was the sound of those shovels. The following morning, I told Tony, and we took an oath together, never to tell a soul. The next time I made myself look from my bedroom window, all the slabs were in place. Not a sign that anything had happened. Sometimes I could almost believe that it hadn't. Until she was dug up again. It was an awful secret that we carried around with us. Oh, God. What am I going to do without him? Without Tony? A murder of Joe for good one. You do not have to say. But anything you do say may be given in evidence.
Thanks for the show the other night. Just your scene, eh? Nice bit of beef. A nice black tube steak up your stank. Look, this is not official, you understand, but under the circumstances, I think it's appropriate to give you a little taster. My recommendation is that disciplinary papers are served on Calder, D.I. Birkin and D.S. Oswald. I am critical of the way the station was run. Procedures need to be tightened up, too many canteen cowboys. But I find no one to blame for the death of Tony Allen. Clearly, David, you're the right man to sort this station out. And of course, Congratulations to you too, Mike. Nailing Jason Reynolds and getting the move upstairs. I shall have to give you the name of my tailor. He's particularly adroit at disguising any tendency towards the middle-aged spread. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, do you intend to do anything about this press story, sir? Yeah, let it blow over. Oswald's back at West End Lane? Yes, sir. But besides, Tennyson's a bloody good detective. Perhaps, but one who's displayed a considerable lack of judgment. I think you know what I mean. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that Jason Reynolds is going away for a very long time. The CPS has informed me that they're not going to press charges against anyone else. So well done. Right, well, I don't know about you, but I'm off to the pub where I'd like to buy each and every one of you an extremely large drink. That won't be necessary, Jane. Perhaps I can take this opportunity to make an announcement. Mr. Kernan here will, from now on, be known to you all as Chief Superintendent Kernan. Great. I'm also very pleased to be able to introduce his successor here at Southampton Row. Superintendent Thorndyke. Thank you, Commander. I realize that I may have made a few enemies carrying out the investigation on behalf of MS-15. So the best thing to do is to clear the air straight away. If anyone thinks it's going to be a problem for them, get in the way of the smooth running of the station, then they should apply for a transfer immediately. And uh, since we're all about to go off duty, just to prove I have a lighter side, I've arranged for us all to have a drink to mark the occasion. It's round the back. So I didn't even merit an interview. Jane. Sir, could I have a word with you, please? Official or unofficial? Official. Jane, it can wait, sure. No, it can't wait. Okay. You'll have my formal request for a transfer first thing in the morning. Very well.
Have you seen the size of these chalky nut clusters? <laughs> of course. I designed them. New chocolate and nut clusters from Gino Janelli. Marie Claire is made up of millions of voices. I base my career on other people's talents. My team have to travel at a moment's notice. Not only can we report about what's going on in the world, but maybe do something about it. If you give someone an American Express corporate card, you're giving them freedom and security. It's a convenient tool you'd be daft not to use in business. The American Express corporate card, used by sensible businesses everywhere. Now there's a completely new dimension to achieving healthy and beautiful skin. Nivea Visage Optimal. A unique and exclusive formula delivering rapid and continuous moisturization and it's vitamin enriched. Nivea Visage Optimal provides long-lasting moisturization all day long, day after day. Exclusively from Nivea Visage. If you're looking for a used car, let your Rover dealer look for you. He has immediate access to a wide variety of quality used Rovers. He'll find the model you want with the features you want, and he'll ensure it's been checked and approved by a specialist Rover inspector before you take delivery. At Rover Dealers, we care enough to take all the worry out of acquiring a used car. Well, nearly all. Think of a tasty treat. Muller Lite and Muller Rice, now down to only 25 pence each. Think Co-op, because we're always thinking of you. Tom, 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 Tom. Whatever the occasion, settle us Tums, settle Tums. A host of stars await in the new season of movie premieres. Alien 3. Blame it on the bellboy. Lethal Weapon 3. The hand that rocks the cradle. Double impact. The best new season movie premieres only on Time Tees. from the studios of ITN The News with Nicholas Owen. Good evening. The headlines tonight. UN threatens action after 37 die in Sarajevo marketplace shelling. James Molyneux resigns after 16 years as Ulster Unionist leader. And it's a draw. Atherton's men share the test honours. The UN Secretary General has tonight given a strong signal that NATO forces should retaliate after today's mortar attack in Sarajevo. Dr. Boutros Boutros Ghali has pledged what he called appropriate action without delay. 37 people were killed in the massacre and scores wounded when a single shell exploded near the city's main market. Michael Nicholson at ITN reports on the latest atrocity in the Bosnian conflict. The timing was deliberate, it always is the busiest hour of the day in the busiest place. The gunners knew what they were doing. One mortar shell precisely targeted and the worst massacre in the city in 18 months. And at a time when even those who've spent the past three years under siege and bombardment were beginning to think the worst was really over and with a new peace initiative underway. They should have known that whenever there's talk of peace, there are those who will do anything to sabotage it. The Kosovo hospital has not seen such carnage since the Bosnian Serbs shelled the marketplace in February last year. So many dead today, and almost a hundred wounded, some so critically, the death toll will rise by the end of it. People queued outside, shouting a name, pleading for news, but even as they waited, even as the wounded were being treated, the hospital itself was hit. 
The Bosnian Serbs said, as they always do, that the Bosnian Muslims had shelled themselves. Whenever we have been on a sort of juncture in the talks, Muslim government uh, has staged uh, a massacre of uh, their own people in order to sabotage the conference and in order to uh, blame the Serbs. Now we would like to know what is the role of NATO in this? Are they going to stand by while we are being killed and massacred? And who'll answer that question? The peace brokers meeting in Paris reckon a new American initiative has a chance to work despite today's killings. We have come here tonight on a mission of peace, but in a very sad time. Our first project here is to express our condolences on behalf of President Clinton and the United States government for the outrageous tragedy that happened in Sarajevo today. The US well, I'm sorry that report ended so abruptly. The Ulster Unionist Party is preparing for a fierce leadership contest after James Molyneux announced he's resigning. After leading the party for 16 years, he said today he wants to give his successor time to prepare for the next election. And we will have a report on that in a few moments' time. Scientists are trying to discover why the prototype of the first wave-powered electricity generator sank off the coast of Scotland. It was launched less than a month ago. It was hoped that the experimental generator, which cost three and a half million pounds, would become the world's first commercial wave energy power station. The 8,000 ton structure was supposed to create electricity by using waves. Instead, it sank beneath them. Cornwall's fishermen held their annual fish festival today and received a big thank you from Canada for supporting them in their fish war against Spain. Among the guests was the Canadian Fisheries Minister Brian Tobin, there to deliver his own personal message of thanks. James Bays reports. It's carnival time in the Cornish fishing port of Newlyn, and today they were welcoming a visitor from the other side of the world. The Canadian Fisheries Minister arrived on a Cornish trawler. He was greeted as a hero by most locals because of his role taking on the Spanish in a dispute over fishing rights in Newfoundland. I think that uh, people of this community, and these communities, I should say, have given us the kind of lift as a country that we haven't had for a very long time. So I'm really here to say thank you. For months across West Cornwall, the Canadian maple leaf flag has been flying everywhere. Local fishermen claim they face the same problems as their Canadian counterparts, with the Spanish fleets operating illegally, using undersized nets and breaking agreed quotas. They're angry that the Spanish will soon be allowed to fish in the so-called Irish box, an area they see as their traditional fishing grounds. Today, however, not everyone was welcoming the Canadian minister. A group of animal rights campaigners tried to disrupt his speech. They were led away by police after the protest against Canada's involvement in the seal trade. Now we return to the Ulster Unionist Party, which is preparing for a fierce leadership contest after James Molyneux announced he's resigning. He's led the party for 16 years. He said today he wants to give his successor time to prepare for the next general election. From Belfast, this report by John Irvine. Jim Molyneux's resignation statement was typically restrained. He was 75 yesterday and said he was stepping down to allow a new leader to prepare for a general election. There would be no further comment. He's been Ulster Unionist leader for 16 years. Jim Molyneux has served his country in war and peace now for a long period of time, indeed throughout his life, and uh, I'm very sorry to see him going at this critical juncture. In a parliamentary career that began with his election as an MP in 1970, the two low points for Jim Molyneux have been his feelings of betrayal at the signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985 and the publication of the joint framework document earlier this year. Recently, he has refused to lead his party into talks with Sinn Féin in advance of IRA disarmament. Four MPs are likely to enter the contest to succeed him. Ken McGuinness or John Taylor could be regarded as Liberals, more likely to talk to Republicans and the Irish government. On the right wing of the party, Martin Smith or William Ross would probably follow the Molyneux line. The Ulster Unionist Party's ruling council will meet within the next three weeks to elect Jim Molyneux's successor. The direction in which he chooses to take the party is an unknown factor, with implications for a peace process already in danger of losing its way. John Irvine, ITN, at Unionist Party headquarters in Belfast. 
Attempts by the United Nations to repatriate thousands of Rwandan refugees from eastern Zaire have been hampered by grenade attacks and landmines. It's not known who's responsible, but the UN fears it will put off refugees already frightened to return home. Zaire has threatened to restart forced expulsions if further talks fail. A British travel agent, Michael Clark, appeared in court in the Philippines accused of promoting child prostitution. Mr. Clark from Eastbourne has denied the charge and said the whole affair was a setup. If convicted, he faces a prison sentence of 40 years. And forest fires have been sweeping across northern Portugal. Villagers joined hundreds of firefighters battling walls of flame up to six miles long. Arsonists have been blamed for starting similar fires earlier this month. Cricket, the final test match and the series have ended in a draw. England skipper Mike Atherton scored 95 to help fight off a fierce attack from the West Indian bowlers. Here's Ben Scotchbrook. From the start of play, England were looking for an honourable draw. The West Indies were looking to win. Jason Gallion added just three runs to his score before Stuart Williams caught him out at third slip. And Kirtley Ambrose made short work of John Crawley, dismissing him just 12 balls later. England had the jitters, and suddenly the much-needed draw was looking far from certain. But Mike Atherton stood firm, scoring his half-century before lunch. And after lunch, the West Indies pace bowlers were hitting back, sometimes all too literally. Undeterred, the England skipper fought on until he edged the ball into the hands of Brown, missing his century by just five runs. But the captain's innings, together with a second 50 from Graham Hick, 